uh, organizing secretary for the upcoming POSICON 2024. So we welcome Dr. Sukalyan. Next is Dr. Sitanshu Barik. He has come all the way from Ames Deoga. He is MCH in uh, pediatric orthopedics from Ames Rishikesh and a uh, lot of other fellowships, including Upper Limb Fellowship from Vienna. Uh, he has done his SR ship from CNBC, uh, Chacha Nehru um, College, uh, Delhi, and Chacha Nehru Hospital, Delhi, and Ames, uh, Delhi, and Rishikesh. We welcome Dr. Sitan Shubarik. Next is our own Dr. Ritesh Runusar, who is an additional professor at IGIMS Hospital. He has a fellowship in Pediatric Hospital at GMRF. And uh, he is a PG DHM at National Institute of Health and Family Sciences, New Delhi, and is a faculty for ATLS with the Nodal Center, um, IGMS Patna. We welcome Dr. Ritesh Runusar. Next, uh, Dr. Ritesh Fandesar has not uh, joined us. So he is my colleague, fellow colleague, and he works at present as an additional professor in Ames Patna. Uh, we were together in CMC Ludhiana, and uh, he is also, he was an ex-state representative of Assami India, Bihar and Jharkhand, and is an executive member of Assami India at present. He has a lot of fellowships, including from Mumbai, Tokyo, Beijing, and has 21 publications till date. We welcome Dr. Ritesh Pandey. Dr. Saurabh Chaudhary is an MBBS from JIPMER and uh, MS and DNB. He's a consultant, consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon working in Patna at Mediversal Hospital and Kurji Holy Family Hospital. He's a consultant spine surgeon at CNS Hospital and has a senior residency from JIPMER Pondicherry. He has undergone a uh, one-year fellowship under Dr. Manoj Padnam from Delhi. We welcome Dr. Uh, Saurabh Chaudhary. He has also not joined us yet. And uh, uh, Dr. Shashikant is from is an assistant professor from PMCH. He has 21 publications and has, apart from pediatric orthopedic interest in uh, joint replacements also. Dr. Shashikant is also yet to join. And finally, I am the organizing secretary for this event. I work as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Paris Hospital. And I have been trained under Hitesh sir and uh, Ganga Hospital and from England, uh, Blackburn Hospital and of course, I'm working with Dr. John Mukhopadhyay sir in this hospital. I'm the current state representative of Assami India and the section editor in pediatric orthopedics in our own JODT. So we welcome you all. So this is a two day event and not to miss, of course, with our Paris who has been working day in and day out for this course. I welcome all the delegates and plus our sponsors who are the, our backup for this program, Deputynthes. Cure India, Mrs. Ranjana is here, who would be presenting his small talk on club food program and the Pitker Ortho Tools. So thank you, everyone. I um, declare this program open. And from here on, we'll start with our talks. Our first talk is by Dr. Dhiren, sir. We welcome you, sir. Uh, the moderator for this session is Dr. Ratnesh Singh. Is he here? The chairperson for this session is Dr. D.K. Sinha, sir. I don't think he has joined yet. Dr. Amulya Singh, sir. Dr. Rajiv Anand, sir, please join on the dice. And Dr. Ramit Gunjan, he is also known. So Dr. N.K. Singh, sir, please. And Dr. Bashir Am, sir, please join on the dice, sir. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we'll start the first session that is on uh, CTEV. And the first speaker may I call upon Dr. Dhiren Ganjawala, and he'll be talking on pathoanatomy, differential diagnosis, and scoring systems in congenital talipus equinovirus. Dr. Dhiren Ganjawala, please. Yes or no? Yeah, this is the most challenging time because we had a very good lunch and then to remain alert is really a challenge, but fine. Uh, we will try our level best to keep you alert. Now, how many of you have treated uh, a child with a club food? Everyone. Everyone. Good. Fine. So, probably this lecture is going to be a just repetition of the knowledge which you already have. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, so uh, in this presentation, we are going to discuss uh, three points. The first, what are the components of gentlemen? This is progressing. So, the component of the club book, uh, how to have a differential diagnosis, and uh, a severity assessment. So, first point, what are the components of club book? What are the components for the Younger uh, orthopedic surgeons. Yeah. There was adduction. There was adduction. Right, very good. So basically, yes, you are absolutely right. The first is Kavas. Now, the one point which we would like to understand in this, and that is very applicable in the treatment, is when we say Kavas, we need to differentiate that this is not plantaris. In plantaris, all the metatarsal are plantar fresh, while in Kavas, it's the first metatarsal which is plantar flex. Now to understand that, I will, I will try to give you one animation. So we are looking at a right side of the foot and this is high foot. This is medial side and this is lateral side. And this line is showing the plane of the hind foot. So that shows that the hind foot is in bars. Now in relation to that, if we look at the fourth foot, the first metatarsal is plantar flex, while the fifth is not that much. So, if we look at this uh, line, the blue line, the plane, that shows that the hind foot and fore foot they are not in the same plane, and there is a pronation of the fore foot in relation with the hind foot. So, this is very important because when we start the casting technique, we need to correct this deformity. Only then we will be able to align the hind foot with four foot. So, Kavas is a four foot pronation. Then comes the second deformity, that is four foot reduction. And in that, if you look at the long axis of the talus, this is a foot model in which the dorsum of the skin is removed. The skin on the bottom of the foot is removed, and we can see that this is talus, and this black line is designating the long axis of talus. <coughs> In relation to that, if we look at the third metatarsal, the third toe line, it is not in the straight line, but it is deviated medially. So that designates the four foot adduction. The third component is we are looking at the foot from behind, and we can see that this is a long axis of the leg and hind foot is in varus. And the fourth component, very clear, and that's the equinus, where this is the long axis of the leg, and this is the long axis of the foot. And we can see that it's in a plantar flexion or equinus. Now we come to the second point, the types of club foot. The types of the club foot are basically idiopathic. I would say 95 to 97 percent of the club foot deformity are idiopathic, and that's where we are going to focus tomorrow in the session. However, small number of cases are secondary club foot because of some neurological defor uh, deformity. And the question I would like you to understand is like why we really need to differentiate between the idiopathic one and the secondary one. <laughs> yeah, why why we really need to differentiate? Yeah, in the secondary we have to correct. Okay. Okay, so the first point is like in the secondary we need to correct the cause. Let let me give you an example. Suppose it's a because of the arthrogryposis deformity. Can we correct the arthrogryposis? If we take a spina bifida, can we correct the spina bifida? No. Then? That's the most important thing. Like the prognosis, the chances of recurrence or the relapse are very different in both the category. And that we need to explain to the family member or the family when we start the treatment. 
because if we don't tell them this is going to have a higher chances of relapse then when the relapse occurs they would probably say that humko to kuch bataya nahi tha so it's very important that we understand first of all that it's different and then we explain that to the family so now the next question is how to differentiate we understood the first point that it's important to differentiate the next point is how to differentiate and for that we need to examine the child we first of all look at the general examination that looks with the facial features the second is we look at the spine hip and the knee and we look at the range of motion and the movements also and that will give us a clue whether it's a idiopathic or secondary club foot and then we look uh, need to look at the okay fine my time is up okay yeah yeah and then we look at the neurology that is basically to look at the range of motion so like this child if you look at the ear that says that there is a some abnormality if we look at the facial feature that itself says that this is something different again uh, the child face itself says that this is not a normal child fine if you are clear enough and if you have a vast experience like uh, dr hitesh or dr john then you can definitely say that this is this condition but fine if you can't do uh, if you can't do that it's okay but please understand that this is not normal idiopathic variety of clock foot these are like evident case where we can see the swelling on the back and that's a spina bifida or sometimes there is a subtle sign like uh, this if you see the puckering of the skin on one knee so these are the evidence which tells us that something is different this is one point which we need to differentiate the metatarsus adductus and club foot a lot of patients they come to us with a metatarsus adductus and then uh, we consider it as a club foot then it's probably a too big a dose of treatment for that so metatarsal adductus is only a four foot adduction while in uh, classical ctv all the four components that's the cavus equinus hind foot varus and four foot adduction are present the last point is about the severity score dr sapit pirani from british columbia Uh, he described the severity of club foot, and he has uh, like the forefathers from India. So he travels to India, and he uh, helped us to understand the severity score in great detail. So in that, there are two big components: the midfoot and the hind foot. These are the two components. In each, there are three criteria which we look for. So for hind foot, we look at the medial crease. For second point is we look at the lateral border of the club foot and the third is how much head is covered by navicular so that's my palpation so these are the three things which we look and the hind foot assessment is the posterior crease ankle dorsiflexion and the last one is the empty hip side i will not go into the detail but this is very important for us because it tells us that how the club foot is progressing if we are giving treatment it tells us that the score is gradually going down and that gives us an idea and we can demonstrate that to the family member that improvement is taking place with each plaster it is equally important to understand after the end of the club foot treatment say like uh, all the five plasters are over and then you are following up the child and if relapse is going to take place then we can identify with the pirani severity score so this is very useful in the treatment and um, we will discuss about this how to score the child uh, there are different criteria that we will discuss tomorrow when we have more time in the um, hands on session so with that i end my talk i will be happy to take any question if any point is not clear please feel free to ask any questions okay yeah sir very basic question sir uh, regarding the pirani score sir every time when you are doing applying a cast every time you may make yes. a chart of it yeah That's every it. time we have to do the pirani score 
and then we have to note down that this is hind foot score this is mid foot score yeah so every time each plaster before each plaster we carry out uh, pyramid score right and that itself shows like the graph shows that the improvement is taking place uh, till what time you would like to continue at the plaster will you stop at some time or will go on continuing till you find okay that's another important point like uh, the another point how pyramid score help is like when to carry out phenotomy that information is also uh, we can uh, derive from the pyramid score so when pyramid score is like starting from six or five when it comes to one it's a time where we need to go for the club foot phenotomy and with phenotomy it should become zero so that's a full correction so that is how it gives us an idea thank you yeah, so it's important to understand the Pirani score is not actually a classification of the club foot or, se or the severity of the club foot. It is really a scoring system to monitor your casting. Okay, unlike there are some other scores which look at the severity of the club foot, but the Pirani score is really a system to monitor your treatment as you go along and to see that you're getting the response that you, are, you want from your casting. Okay, so we, we go on to the Ponsetti method now. Uh, so I think basically uh, we're going to look at how we assess and plan our treatment. Uh, I think this is a, a photograph which is often shown as a club foot, but interestingly, if you look at the hands and the foot, it's probably a hemiplegic uh, child rather than a true club foot. Uh, this is in the Louvre in Paris. Now, what is important about Ponsetti is that it's a system which he's come to after years and years of uh, studying the club foot, looking at uh, fetal feet uh, dissections, uh, doing the casting himself, trying to find out where the deformity is. And this is a treatment which he has come to after a long and arduous uh, sort of uh, study of what the club foot is. And what he came to was the basic principles is that unlike in the kite method, you are actually treating most of the components simultaneously except the equinus. Remember, I think this was mentioned by Diren earlier, the cavus is really due to a relative pronation of the forefoot. Uh, when you look at the whole foot together, um, when you abduct the foot with the head of the talus as the fulcrum, uh, this is going to gradually correct the deformity including the heel varus and foot supination. And the equinus is corrected with dorsiflexion right at the end of the casting. And if you are not getting enough dorsiflexion, you need to do a tenotomy. And in real terms, it is close to 80 to 90% of the cases that you actually end up doing tenotomies. So these are the four elements of the club foot according to Ponsetti. There's cavus, adductus, varus, and equinus. And you need to correct each of these, but the cavus is corrected by elevating the first metatarsal, uh, adductus by abducting the midfoot, the varus by averting the calcaneus, and equinus by dorsiflexion of the talus. So the first step is cavus correction, and how you do it is by elevating the head of the first metatarsal, in that you're relatively supinating the foot. So you can see that in the model, how it's done, and you can see that in real life. Now you can see the picture in the left, you can see the cavus there. And as you supinate the foot, you can see how that cavus disappears. So that's the first stage of your cast. Your first stage, you're not trying to correct the foot or abduct the foot. You're just elevating the first head of the first metatarsal to get rid of the cavus in the foot. And after that, you start this forefoot adduction, which you, so you're abducting the forefoot and you're correcting the forefoot adduction and heel varus and your fulcrum is the head of the talus. So, so you put your thumb on the head of the talus and you abduct the entire foot along with it. So you're pulling the foot across to the lateral side. And interestingly, the heel varus and the forefoot and the foot supination get corrected. Okay, so what he says is that unlike um, uh, the, the kite method where you kept the thumb at the calcaneocuboid joint, you need to keep the thumb or the fulcrum at the head of the talus. Okay, so that's how you hold it. 
you're not holding the heel this is my, my fingers are there but you're not holding the heel the heel should be free and you abduct the forefoot while you're keeping the head of the first metatarsal elevated so you never pronate the foot in correcting the club foot you're still keeping that in the relatively supinated position and then abducting the foot on it okay so just showing you how you do that cast and this is how the heel will now correct itself so as you abduct the forefoot you can see how the heel which is in varus comes out of position into a valgus position and this is the video uh, again done by the uh, ponsetti people showing how when you abduct the foot you will see how the heel is correcting itself and you're going to see that in the models in the hands on workshop tomorrow now remember the last cast before the tenotomy the foot is rotated 60 to 70 degrees external with respect to the thighs okay so that is the position of your last cast before the tenotomy and then you do your tenotomy so the right foot correction as you go in the uh, very the position of the foot changes as your serial casting by the fourth fifth and definitely by the sixth in most of the early club foot patients you should get this correction and with that will then allow you to go on to doing your tenotomy which is really a complete section of the ten tendon it's not a uh, fractional lengthening etc you are cutting right through the tendon with a knife uh, ponsetti did it in the opd uh, that's a choice you have to make whether you do it in the ot setting but try and avoid giving anesthesia to these children unless absolutely necessary because that has its own problems with the young child because you're doing this correction at a very young age uh, this is to show how the tendon grows back even after tenotomy so you can see this is a patient who then had to have a posterior release later because of a recurrence and you can see how the tendon which earlier had undergone a tenotomy has completely regenerated there will be an element of fibrosis it's not the glistening tendon you have where nothing has been done but it is solid uh, tendon with all the power so as ponsetti said it took 40 years for the orthopedic thumb to meet uh, to move a centimeter from the calcaneo cuboid joint to the head of the talus and now how do you maintain correction once you've got the correction this is the foot abduction brace or the steenbeck brace which has different sizes it's available off the shelf and the first 3 months it's they wear it 24 hours except at the time of uh, sort of bathing etc and the exercises and then after 3 months you use it at night times and whenever the child naps during the daytime and now the sort of uh, recommendation is that you continue this for at least 4 years early on it was 2 years then it went on to 4 years another part of the treatment is some of these uh, people will need a uh, t uh, tibialis anterior transfer around the ages of 4 to 5 because they will have this dynamic adduction of the forefoot when they are walking so a couple of examples this is a young child again we don't always do x rays in these children and this is a four year follow up showing a good correction child is able to squat and is able to walk pretty normally with the uh, correction of the forefoot so what the uh, ponsetti method does is that you end up with a mobile and supple foot which with the very major soft tissue releases we were doing earlier very often these patients ended up with stiff feet Here's another longer term follow up it's at about a 8 year follow up showing a good correction of the club foot which was originally uh, the picture that we've shown on the left so in conclusion i think the consensus of treatment has come a full circle uh, so we started with conservative treatment with the kite method which was very popular in the 50s then you went on to early soft tissue release with turco etc uh then uh, the surgery became more and more radical people even advocated neonatal surgery to get the best releases then you went on to a la carte surgery and then you're back to conservative treatment so just uh, i think the club foot treatment is really uh, the true um uh, sort of uh, tribute to these words by george santayana which said that let us welcome the future knowing that soon it will be the past and let us respect the past knowing that once it was all that was humanly possible thank you thank you very much sir any questions from the house we we'll have the question at the end of the next talk okay. after the, the, the yeah. three talks we have a discussion session sir right uh,
Thank you. Uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Hitesh Shah. He will be talking on the role of posterior medial soft tissue release. Uh, may I request Dr. Ramit to come, to come forward. A chairperson, we started slightly early. You come here. Yes, sir, Dr. Hitesh. Yeah, good afternoon all. Before we'll set up, I will also emphasize the things on the... Yeah, it's uh, the club foot treatment is that it's like a pendulum. It started with the conservative and in the radical surgery, now went back into the conservative treatment. So it's very important. Even in uh, our training also, we have seen a lot of soft tissue release but it has changed into the conservative pendulum again. Before going into surgical aspects, uh, late presenting club foot, I'll still emphasize that, that there is a role of the ponsetti manipulation and casting, serial manipulation and casting. Why, why it is important? Because the, the ponsetti described in the United States in the very young kids, he doesn't have any experience developing world it's a surgeon from the all over the india or all over the, the asia as well as africa they have contributed into literature at then it's come into the place that the conservative treatment will have still role in the the late presenting child with the club foot so before going and the my topic was also the soft tissue release but i'm i'm still like to emphasize that the most of the non idiopathic the most of the idiopathic children will require the non-operative treatment in the ponsetti. The role of surgery will be there for the non-idiopathic patient like multiple congenital contracture, the spina bifida, diastomatum bilia, spinal dysraphism, those cases will require the surgery. The majority of the case, even in late presentation, the primary role, it is a change. Please understand it's a change because when we were in training always that we need to have a six months, one year, the failure of cast after five cast, four cast, it does about the surgery. It is not there now, true for even older patient. So the role of serial manipulation is still its role and the in, even in older child. So what is the consensus for that? Even in up to the five to six years, you can do about the, the serial manipulation and casting. Again, the difference between the younger presentation and older presentation, because they may develop the secondary bony changes, the more time is required, more number of castings are required, but that would be the role. It's as much as up to the 10 casts. Normally, if you do about in a young child, less than six months, generally three to five casts would be adequate to correct about serial manipulation before doing about tendoachillestenotomy. but it can go in an older child, depends on the severity of the cases. Like this is the child presented with three years, treated with the serial manipulation and casting. And you can see it's very well corrected foot. Then you even said after the three years, the Ponsetti methods works. But I'm not going in more detail because the both of our earlier speaker has already covered the pathonotomy casting serial manipulation. But I like to emphasize first, there is still role in the older chain. But in proportion of patient will require the surgery because of the failure of treatment, maybe 5% or maybe less than that in idiopathic and non-idiopathic, it will go up to the 50%. So what are the indication of the surgery? That is a resistant club foot or the relapsed club foot. Most commonly it is a secondary club foot like a syndromic club foot or the multiple congenital contracture or a spina bifida or the like child with the Mobius syndrome or female syndrome syndrome. That is common in the secondary club foot. So the message here, whenever we are failed to correct the treatment with the serial manipulation, always think there is something wrong with underlying disease, like there may be neurological cause, there may be associated with the syndrome. As Diren Bhai said in earlier talk, your face may be abnormal, spine may be abnormal, upper limb may be abnormal, or entire the hip, knee, ankle. There may be lack of creases like this child will be there in the multiple congenital contracture, or it may be the tibial hemimalia or diastrophic dysplasia. 
the aim is to in the child even in the older child to correct the foot to obtain the foot to looking like a plantigrade foot looks normal and function normal so that is the aim irrespective of the age plantigrade supple normal looking foot with without compromising the muscle strength maintaining the normal power maintaining the normal function maintaining the normal gait pattern and that would be the painless and avoid the recurrence why these are the all important points with soft tissue release no doubt it looks very good but ultimately sometimes it may be the scar tissue and the posteromedial structure of the club foot is so tight fibrotic it may tends to relapse second part it may lead to the stiffness so if it is possible those aim can be corrected with the non operative treatment the first priority should be non operative treatment so what should we do to get the normal relationship between the tarsal bone uh, we need to understand about what are the deformity hind foot equinus hind foot varus for foot adduction eversion and equinus that's a cavus what is required to release all structure that required to be a tight avoid fusing the joint that is a first priority if you are looking at that non idiopathic club foot or a soft tissue release retain the normal power how to retain avoid over lengthening of tendon and restore the muscle imbalance as dr john said very commonly in older patient it will require the tibial is anterior transfer either split transfer or a complete transfer restoring the normal gait to get the foot in plantigrade and foot to be supple and muscle balance across ankle subtalar and tarsal joint there are various in season posterior in season posterior medial in season turco in season hemi cincinnati in season mackel in season full cincinnati on says or complete subtalar release but why this is there the almost the complete subtalar release is eradicated none of the children will require because the first few plaster we can main, maintain the suppleness of the the subtalar as well as the mid tarsal the most commonly it is medial or a posterior medial release will be required why it is required to do about choice because the posterior medial structures are tight including the skin so very commonly it can lead to the necrosis and the fibrosis and the, to avoid this we need to select the incision that will lead to the no necrosis without any scar complication the choice of uh, uh, the incision should say we can reach to the all the structure adequately permit about a tension free closure and the scar should heal well and should facilitate the reoperation if it is needed and scar should be cosmetically acceptable maybe the this is the scar for the as i said it's a complete hemi cincinnati incision but we prefer the hemi cincinnati for hind foot equinus residual equinus it's only posterior incision is enough if it is isolated and posterior capsulotomy and ankle and subtalar joint would be required in older child where it is the do about the surgery you can release about the posterior tibiofibular ligament in order to move about the talus into the dorsiflexion if the if it is not released the ankle mortis is not widely open so we cannot do about the dorsiflexion at the ankle joint for correcting the hind foot varus required to do the tibialis posterior lengthening and the subtalar capsulotomy correcting the four foot adduction we need to do the tibialis posterior lengthening tibialonavicular capsulotomy and adductor hallucis for the equinus the cavus equinus of the forefoot is required to do the plantar fascia for the inversion deformity in do the tibialis posterior lengthening so we prefer the hemi cincinnati incision this is example the child has been 6 year old child with severe club foot with the pronated foot so looks from the side that's the preferred incision was the posterior medial incision that's the hemi cincinnati incision that's exposure of the medial side and we can see the tendo achilles is cleared the here the tendo achilles is there after doing about tendo achilles lengthening we come on the medial side dissect on the neuro neurovascular structure tibial nerve and posterior tibial artery and vessel and after dissecting on the posterior aspects we can go on the front and see about whether this the capsulotomy of ankle and a subtalar joint can be open from the back without disturbing the deltoid ligament the medial release we can identify it about the tibialis posterior and do about lengthening of the tibialis posterior on a, after tibialis posterior lengthening distal part of the tib, ten, tibialis posterior we can see and open about the talonavicular joint and that is the most important aspect because the fulcrum in club foot is that talonavicular joint and if we can 
dissect the talonavicular joint very well, we can able to correct the deformity quite well. Then on the forefoot adduction, we do about the lengthening of the abductor hallucis. And this is the foot looks after the closure. It's a tension free and corrected very well. This is the case in the older child with the severe callosity. The trial has been treated with the hemisynthanate and it looks quite okay. The callosity disappears during period of time. This is a few example of the club foot treated with the hemisynthanate. It's a morphological outcome, scar looks good. And that is a good amount of the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Motor function is quite good. Range of motion is acceptable. It's good functional and subjective outcome. The surgery is warranted in few cases, as I repeat, it not required necessary in all the cases, it's required to do for the failure of conservative treatment or recurrence or a non-idiopathic right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions from the three speakers? Uh, Dr. Dhiran Ganjwala regarding the pathoanatomy. Dr. John right. Mukhopadhyay about the Ponsetti casting techniques or TA anatomy, or Dr. Hitesh Shah, the posterior media release. Any question from the audience? Okay. Uh, to the John Mukhopadhyay, sir, uh, to the our resident, where exactly you will do the tenotomy in? Oh, yes. Oh, sir. sir, there is a one question from me. So I don't want to take that undoubt. <laughs> but it's. Yeah, carry on. Oh, sir, yeah. sir, why uh, there we do external rotation before tenotomy? Sir, why do we do external rotation, rotation uh, before tenotomy? So the reason is when you're putting a cast above the uh, knee. Abduct the forefoot, you automatically are going to externally rotate the leg on the side. Okay, so that's how, and that is where you know that you're in the correct position. Okay, because you're abducting the forefoot on the, I mean, hind foot over that with the palus as the fulcrum. And when you do that, you're automatically externally rotating the whole leg. Yeah? Thank you, sir. It's not external rotating. The, the question, it's a part of the treatment. Oh, okay. And the, coming to the first question, when we do the tenotomy, when only hind foot deformity left, all the forefoot mm -hmm. deformity. Where? 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 Okay, where? where? Not where. where? No. Oh, where? where? Okay, I'm sorry. So you're going to show the video. Oh, okay. Where? Where? Foot is externally rotated during casting. DBL in torsion is part of deformity of club foot. We correct that also at the time uh, while we are doing it externally rotated. Yes. And uh, by foot abduction, definitely it appears like that. So torsion, PPL torsion in the club foot is a totally uh, controversial thing because if you look at different studies, they'll give you different. Some will say external, some will say internal, some will say no torsion. So we really don't know whether the tibia is internally uh, rotated or not, to be honest. Yeah, syndromic club foot is a different thing we're talking about, yeah. In those cases, uh, for how long you would like to go for casting? Many times after seven or eight casts. So you need to see it. whether you're getting response or not. So if you're getting a response to your casting, you'd continue it till you get correction. So you may go up. To, so in the older children, so when we do Ponsetti in the older children, sometimes it needs 10, 12 casts before you get to the correct position. But uh, so similarly, but when, if you stop getting any response, between one cast and the other, that's time to stop. Uh, Dr. Hitesh, like uh, for the posterior release after the length, uh, lengthening of the TA, you do the posterior capsulotomy of the ankle joint. Is it necessary to do always to the subtalar capsulotomy? Uh, the, a very important question, but uh, yes, it is needed in case of the older patient where there is a long standing the equinus is there. And second, also, when we do about the posterior subtalar, that will help us to go on the medial side. Yeah. And suppose that the deformity is fully corrected. So yeah, should we no, go? No need for that. No need for that. Yeah. No, so if you look at x-rays of the club, early on when we used to do x-rays, there's this reduction of the talocalcaneal angle. Yeah. Okay? Between the talus and so you need to open that out to get correction. 
Otherwise, you're getting a spurious correction. Okay. Because the deformity of the equinus happen at the two joints, at the ankle and subtalar. So we need to do. If it is getting corrected, no need for opening. Yes. 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 Otherwise, if you force it into correction, you're probably getting a, uh, yeah, getting the uh, uh, correction at the wrong level. Yeah. So, in a very good corrected foot, also, there are chances of deformity of relaxation, which is the most common deformity. I think adduction. So, what do you do? So, it's not so four foot adduction if it's a dynamic adduction. That means when they're walking, they're just turning. Otherwise, it's passively correctable. Then you do a tibialis anterior transfer. Okay. But how, how will we assess the dynamic section which needs tibialis and either is split or the total? So when, so when they walk, they go like that. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, the foot is supple and can be corrected. So how will we assess that? That's what you need to assess. How much is the adduction, dynamic adduction is there? So when it's bothersome to the patient. Yeah. <laughs> If, if patients are complaining of it, then. if the foot is passively corrected and overcorrected passively, and when the child stands and walks with that, it's in, inverted. That's a dynamic. We have a next session on dynamic adduction. Actually, Dr. Sandeep Bede is covering that. He'll be joining a little late. Oh, yeah. yeah the next, uh, next what is the upper age limit for a percutaneous stenotomy, sir? So, will you do in like five years also? Uh, generally, the people tends to avoid after two years. Reason is there that can lead to the complete tendon cut along with the paratendon can lead to the weakness. But as the, there is a literature by the AIMS in the Delhi, they have put up to the eight years. So, once he de developed this technique of doing complete tenotomies after the, uh, the prison cramps, okay? Yes. So, the Germans used to cut off the TA to stop them scaling walls. And then two weeks later, they would be doing it again. So he realized that cutting the TA is not a problem. Okay, it heals. So there's no reason whether it's eight or 10. For me, if I'm getting correction, I will still do a percutaneous stenotomy, even in the older child. If I need more than just a tenotomy, that's a different situation. See, in 2000, when I started uh, the Ponsetti technique, I was very like uncomfortable with the idea of doing a complete tenotomy. So I uh, wrote to Dr. Ponsetti uh, the same question, like what for uh, age limit? He said that, uh, so the first thing he said that Diren, even tenotomy in adult have resulted into a normal uh, foot function and the prisoners have run away from the prison. So that is the first thing what he said. And the second thing, uh, he has done it till the age of one and a half year without any problem. So what he just said is like, fine, we can do it up to two also. And what Sir said, we can do it even for older child also. But fine, it's always a hesitation to do it because we are we are always worried about loss of uh, a calf function with complete tenotomy. So in those cases, would you like to go for again percutaneous or you'd like to go a mini open incision? That we will see at the end of the video. Uh, like okay. the, we have a video on tenotomy and then we discuss that point. But one thing which I have realized is that like if someone or even I have done a tenotomy and if there is a recurrence, then the second time tenotomy does not give us a great correction. Because I, I think that there is something more fibrosis at the ankle and the subtalar posterior capsule, which is restricting the equinus correction rather than the Achilles itself. So that if you need a second treatment, they're more likely that you're going to need a third or a fourth one after that. Okay, so the ones which do well first time round and go on to this thing very rarely need a second. The one which needs a second treatment very often needs a third or a fourth treatment. Those are generally stiffer feet with a sort of different connective tissue which reacts differently. So you need to... <laughs> so one more question, sir. Dr. Atul Bhaskar from Mumbai, he has given a classification of the relapsed foot CTV. Do we follow it? He does not consider the neuromuscular ones in that one. And second, in lot of his talks and his this, uh, especially the with the tip and transfer, he says that to do the abductor halosis release also along. So. Yeah, many of them, we 
need to find out which component is there and how severe it is. There, yeah, rather than following any classification, it's very important which component is whether it's high to define as severe or four foot reduction or everything. Then depends on that. Four foot reduction is there. Obviously, it's the abductor hallucis. So I remember a long time ago for us releasing the abductor hallucis used to be part of the yeah. treatment even with the posterior release. Yeah. But uh, we've stopped doing that now. I don't know whether that's made a difference to the results. But at one time, I remember it used to be almost part of the treatment to do that. So it's not something new. It's something that's been yeah. going on for a long yes. time. Hey, welcome, uh, add to your question, when it comes to relapse, it's not the fixed protocol which we can apply in every child. Mm. So first of all, what is that? It's a forefoot, it's a hind foot, it's equinus, or it's a dynamic supination. What is the problem? And accordingly, we have to uh, suggest a trick. Right. So I request the delegates, this is the best faculty we have and everyone is treating club food. So please ask your doubts and questions. So, I think probably so John and Hitesh are the like topmost uh, people in India for the soft tissue procedure. <coughs> so if you have any any question about that, definitely take advantage of uh, expertise of both of them. Ten years ago, maybe. Sir, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, uh, are we still into the stigmas release, the plantar fascia, or uh, we are only dependent on? Lifting the head of the first metatarsal for correction of the cavus these days. Yeah, for equinus, yes, uh, for, the, for the idiopathic variety, the early age presenter, we go for standard concert so, technique. But if child present late, because untreated cases in India are also common. So, an uh, untreated idiopathic case presenting to us by the age of, say, one year, we may need to do a uh, standard release in addition to the conventional concert for the early presenters, we don't. For early presenters. Okay, fine. Yeah, so that's my preference. That's my preference that I, I, I try to cut down the number of plasters with mini release, where I just cut the tendons, not the capsule. And then that significantly reduce the number of plasters. Once you do that soft tissue procedure in maximum four plasters, you are able to correct uh, deformity. So, yes, that's my uh, preference for late presenting cases. Okay. Because I'm in a private practice and each plaster costs uh, a significant rupees to the patient. And so we try to reduce the cost uh, of treatment by issue procedure cost and then the plus maybe you should make your treatment cheaper <laughs> uh, uh, sir uh, there is one question for me uh, sir how many structures uh, we can remove for soft tissue release sorry how many how many uh, which structures we need to release uh, for the, yes, how, many, how, many? how many structures i want to you ask you are talking about the mini soft tissue release yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no i want to ask about the pmr posterior medial soft tissue release how many structures we can remove? How many structures? How, how many structures? Structures we can remove in the Not PMR. Remove. Generally, we do about release. the lengthening or release. Yes, either sir. we can cut, either do the tenotomy or a capsulotomy. Generally, on posterior aspect, the tendo ankle is lengthening, posterior capsule of ankle and posterior capsule of subtil. Medially, there is a tibial is posterior, FHL and FTL in the master knot of Henry. And there is a talonavicular joint capsule, subtalar joint capsule. Okay. And that would be the required. And the spring ligament. And you also need to release the lateral tissues because the lateral tissues serve as a tether. Yes. Okay. So, uh, paradoxically, even though you're doing a medial release, if you don't release the lateral uh, tethers, you will not get the correction. So, you end up releasing the lateral side of the calcaneocuboid joint as well, the lateral side of the ankle as well, and the peroneal tendon sheets, etc to get your correction. Okay, I think uh, we should carry on with yeah, the next yeah. session and- uh, Yeah, it's a close, I have the next session. I think uh, I'll invite Dr. John Mukopa there. Uh, he'll be talking on management in older children, including osteotomy, Jess and Elizabeth. Okay, so we now come to the uh, older child and uh, although Ponsetti works great, uh, we still see uh, sort of problems with some of these patients.
The reality is that we still unfortunately see patients in various stages uh, with problems. Some have had poncetti, some have had medial releases, some have had uh, posterior releases, but you have them at the older age group where you need to do something to correct the foot. So you have various options. You can repeat today. Uh, there are people who are doing Ponsetti even in 10, 12, 15 year olds. But it's quite a cumbersome procedure because you need to put above knee casts ideally. And that in the older child is something which I feel very hesitant to do because then you're sticking them in bed for 15 weeks or something like that. But that's how they do it. The ones who do it in the older children actually do above knee casts in 13, 14 year olds, which I find a little difficult to uh, do in my own practice. Uh, soft tissue releases, uh, Hitesh has talked about. And now we come to the osteotomies. This could be at the hind foot or the mid foot. You have the distraction techniques. You have certain other procedures such as the wedge trasectomies, even a telectomy in the severely arthrogrypotic foot. And finally, the triple arthrodesis, if nothing else works. So uh, starting with the calcaneal uh, the hind foot osteotomy, the classical osteotomy is that of Dwyer. Started, he initially talked about a medial opening wedge osteotomy of the calcaneum because these are the patients who have a heel varus, otherwise the foot is okay. But with the medial opening wedge, there were a lot of skin problems. So most people went towards the lateral closing wedge osteotomy. You have other methods of lateral column shortening starting from at the anterior part of the calcaneum to the cuboid decancelization of the cuboid or the dilvin avon pepper, which is a fusion of the calcaneo cuboid joint. So you take off a wedge from both sides of the calcaneo cuboid joint and fuse it. And that actually gives you some kind of dynamic correction as well. There's also more recently what we call the medial column lengthening. So you can combine that with a lateral column shortening or do it isolated where you uh, osteotomize the navicular, put in a bone graft to lengthen the medial column. So patients who only have problems of varus on the in the midfoot, you can think of doing a medial column uh, lengthening. So more, more often we do a combination of a lateral column uh, shortening and a medial column lengthening, usually at the cuboid, but you can do it at various levels. So you can combine uh, dwires with a medial column lengthening as well. If the problem is more in the heel, for example, in this child, you can see there's a problem in the heel as well as this kind of uh, interning of the foot. So here we did a Dwyer's osteotomy for the calcaneum. And we did, if you see that here, we put in bone graft into this cuneiform and lengthen the medial column. And you can see he's got a fairly good result at the end of it. Now, when you're treating these late presentations, recurrences, don't expect the kind of results that you will get with a uh, primary club foot who comes to you in the initial stages, but he ended up with quite a good function. And you can see his gait is pretty good as well at the end of the treatment. Um, now for some of the really bad club feet, we can think of doing something like a dorsolateral wedge correction, tasectomy, which has been popularized by Viraj Singade from Nagpur. And here's a case where it's a severely arthrogrypotic foot, very poor, very bad deformity. Here we did some serial cast. We were getting no real response to the cast. And then we ended up doing this wedge tasectomy. These are the wires we used to fix it. And you can see how we got a reasonable correction in the foot. Uh, it's a plantigrade foot. It's not going to be a very mobile or supple foot because uh, the foot is stiff to start with. But you can get a reasonable correction. And the dorsolateral uh, wedge tasectomy is a option that you have for some of these very bad club feet. Telectomy is really preserved for severe cases uh, in the arthrogrypotic foot where you have older children, multiple treatments, they have failed and then end up with a very stiff foot like this patient here. Uh, here we ended up doing a telectomy. So that's the incision we use. Uh, that's the entire talus that you end up having to take out. And even after the telectomy in this child, we still had to use distraction to get a decent correction. Um, now we come to differential distraction. Those are the osteotomies that we talked about. Uh, we come to the differential distraction techniques. And this uh, uh, basically you have two options. One is the Jess fixator or the Elizarov uh, method. And Jess is a homegrown 
uh, device, which was uh, designed by Dr. B.B. Joshi from Mumbai and further modified by Dr. Lard and his team uh, with the UMEX fixator. And this is a very simple apparatus, which consists of a number of K wires, some rods, uh, these Allen uh, sort of uh, bolts, which connect the rods and the distractors. And that is how you have a, a system uh, attached to the foot, two wires attached to the foot. We nowadays add a anterior wire to make it a little more stable. You have two wires in the calcaneum and two wires in the forefoot, one which goes across all the bones and two wires which go halfway across. And then you distract it. And as you distract it, what you have to do is gradually with the distraction, you need to reposition the foot. Okay, so you distract it for two weeks and then reposition the foot. And the repositioning is very much like the Ponsetti maneuver. You take out all the connectors and then reposition the foot and then you put on the connectors. And this gives very good results uh, in the sort of age group between say four to seven or so, which are not too rigid, okay? So not too deformed, not too rigid. Here's a child with that kind of severe deformity uh, you can see how with the just corrector uh, fixator, we've been able to correct it quite well. Uh, we did also these uh, uh, graphs which were shown by uh, Hitesh, where just looking at the foot impression on a graph. And you can see how after the correction, the foot which was really badly deformed is now corrected. Even this foot, which was not as bad as the right left foot, again, got corrected quite well. Okay, and that's her corrected position at the end of a three year follow up. Uh, with a good correction, uh, but the Jess fixator does take time, it's cumbersome, and you need to pay a lot of attention to detail. Here's another child with a seven-year follow-up showing an excellent result with the Jess fixator. So in very rigid fit, we, uh, feet, we've even combined distraction with soft tissue releases, etc., and even with telectomy, as I showed. Here's a patient where we did a soft tissue release and then did a Jess distraction, and again, you can see a very good uh, correction in the follow-up with a supple foot. She's able to squat and good correction of the deformity. This is a three-year follow-up on that child. You have to be aware of uh, complications. You can get pin loosening, you can get sepsis. And what is the one that you really need to be careful about is this clawing of toes. And this is avoidable if you pay attention. And if you don't, you can even end up dislocating a joint here. You can see in this patient, actually the first metatarsophalangeal joint has dislocated in the treatment for the club foot with the just fixator. Okay, now relatively simple apparatus as compared to the uh, uh, Elizarov fixator, but you have these problems which you need to take care of. For the older child, you have the Elizarov fixator, which is more versatile. You can use it in more rigid feet and you can even combine it with osteotomies. Okay, so here's an older child. Uh, we can see a very severe foot. Um, there's the x-rays at that stage. Again, a very simple ring application. So you have the, uh, uh, the block on the tibia, the hind foot block. Again, it's just two olive wires, which we put in across. And again, the four foot block, again, two olive wires, which go through three metatarsals each. Okay, and then you just connect them all together and you distract it. Uh, we don't use, uh, we use hinges, but not, they are not particularly designed hinges to start at a particular point. Some people like to fix the talus with a wire as well. We haven't done that, but we are able to get fairly good correction. And again, we re-manipulate the foot after two weeks of distraction to get a decent position. And you can see how he's got a good correction on x-rays as well as a clinically good corrected feet at the end of the treatment. And this is a follow-up at about five years, showing an excellent correction. So uh, I think we have to be aware that we continue to face the challenge of managing neglected and recurrent and resistant club foot deformities. Uh, we have multiple tools in our armamentarium, but really the aim should be to try and avoid these extensive procedures by making sure that you correct them properly in the first place. So the idea is that all the children should have access to treatment at a young age, and today with the Ponsetti treatment, we can treat most of these club feet successfully with simple casts and a tenotomy. And you don't have to go on to doing these very major uh, procedures to correct the feet. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Uh, I thank Jasmine sir for inviting me to this conference, but uh, foot and ankle course, and looking forward to many more such courses in Eastern India. And after John sir's talk, I think this my PPT becomes much more easier because I am going to discuss about neglected cases. So every textbook when we read about CTV, we have this last two three paragraphs which mention salvage surgeries are triple arthrodesis. Then we have our modalities which sir spoke out Elizaro. And what are the options we have when we have a flat top talus? So first case is a 12 year old female with right side CTV relapse. And these are the clinical images which shows the heel virus. And this is an image which is, uh, uh, which is operated in, in 2011, which is one of my seniors. And these are the uh, gate videos of the patient which shows the lateral walking along with heel virus, cavus, and this patient was managed with a triple arthrodesis. So the patient that uh, deformity corrected immediately postoperatively. We had uh, good uh, clinical uh, images postoperatively, but the current consensus which I found from the literature is that they are always poor as compared to other methods of the treatment, be it PMRSTR or Elizarov or Jess. And they have very few, very few limited indications, which include only a stiff or a painful feet, which you do the arthrodesis to reduce the pain, or in case the talus has gone for avian due to your previous prior procedures. So this is the current consensus. So you do triple arthrodesis when you have these two indications. My next case is a nine-year-old male who is a non-intervent right side CTV. The patient presented with this gross deformity, all the images from hind foot, forefoot, cavus is seen in these images. These are the clinical uh, x-rays, which is grotesque and cannot make out. And we have this gait video which shows lateral walking, severe inversion, severe medial facing of the sole of the foot. So it was managed by the Elizar of technique in which we did the distraction histogenesis. So now you'll be seeing this wire here. Now this Oliver was placed in the head of the talus, which was passed from the lateral to side to the medial side. So this was a two staged Elizar of correction. Uh, it was done. And the first phase was with correction of the four foot deformity, that is the adduction. And the second stage surgery was done for the correction of the equinus deformity. Now in the second stage, as you can see, the first stage, the hinges are more on the, which were walked upon were the hinges which are done on the foot. Whereas in the second stage, the hinges which were there in the heel on the uh, proximal part were used. So these were the clean, uh, final images. Now as sir had told, we have to take care of the four foot, uh, the foot, uh, the toe drop and we could not, we, I think we did a, uh, we could not manage it and some things we learned from our mistakes. So this could have been avoided. So, so Ponsetti casting says that you correct the foot in terms of the deformity. That is you correct the forefoot first, then go to the equinus. So same stage, same thing can be also managed through surgical method. It is not necessary that Ponsetti always means conservative treatment. Same principles of Ponsetti is applied by this method in which you do a two stage of Elizar of correction. In the first stage, you do the differential distraction of the medial and lateral column of one mm till adduction is corrected. Stage two, you do initial distraction of both the posterior and anterior columns for distracting for the talus. And then you do a posterior distraction, anterior compression till you achieve around five to 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. So the precautions, we have to avoid the MTP subluxation. Initial plantar release in the, for the first stage should be done. And second stage, when you go for the second stage surgery, you do a either percutaneous or a open TA tenotomy. If it is a non intervened case, we do a percutaneously. If it has been revived, operated earlier, we do a open TA tenotomy and you take the pin tract care. So, salvage procedures like triple arthrodesis are only for salvage. They should not come to your mind unless and until there is nothing left. 
to intervene and positive principles can also be followed surgically and i would like to end my talk with this x-ray which is a uh, patient of 11 years of age with a 30 degree of around equinus with a flat top talus i would like to proceed to uh, for the senior faculties uh, how it should be handled thank you i think we'll start with john sir hitesh sir and dhiran sir and what are, what are the symptoms so it is a 30 degree of equinus the four four uh, the hind foot does not seem to be in severe varus so it is basically a toe walking child with uh, 30 degree equinus so i think with a flat top talus i would use a distraction correction for this okay because you don't want anything you do with uh, any other method you're going to end up compressing the talus more so distract and only start correcting after you've distracted so uh, how do we know i have distracted enough sir like uh... x-rays yeah okay so you get a gap where you once you dorsiflex so same you follow the principles of uh, distraction histogenesis posterior and anterior uh, okay yeah if the families are willing there are other treatments are described like the anterior epiphysiodesis of the distal tibia also but uh, will this correct this much correct uh, okay if if the child is having it's not so much but it will be definitely better and there is a triplane osteotomy yes. of distal tibia is also yes. described because ultimately we'll end up on the stiff anchor even though the we'll do the distraction at the joints also the, our aim is to get the plantigrade foot it will be stiff okay so you need to get it by either at the cora bow cora or below uh, just add on uh, to that uh, is it operated in the past or no there operation? has been uh, twice uh, posterior releases mostly there has, has been, been done already right. so the yes. soft tissue has been taken care yes. of okay so now uh, taken care of means uh, it has been operated twice Ele, means already someone has done it okay but yeah. not not completely corrected now if we look at the x-ray there is a limb discrepancy so uh, frankly this equinus is helping to some extent for correction of the limb length discrepancy okay. so in that case we can give a weight sole that's the first option okay. the second if we want to correct then what uh, sir said is like we can go for distraction uh, technique and the third is in addition to uh, or in instead of heavy uh, epiphysodesis anteriorly we can carry out a supra malleolar osteotomy fine we, we cannot correct 30 degree correction at that point but at least we can have a 15 to 20 degree correction. And also, sir, what is the role of the Y osteotomy that I uh, then need to do the calcaneus to correct? So we do that with the Elizarov. Okay. So you do either a U or a V osteotomy, okay, where you your one limb of the osteotomy goes. So it is something like that. Yeah, from the calcaneum across and one to the back, okay, and then you can distract with the Elizarov on that. So you're getting bony correction as well as soft tissue correction. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. I had a question. So uh, did you, uh, uh, what, that wire you had put in the talus, yeah. are you worried about the joint? Infection. I mean, in, in aspect of the yeah, infection one? Oh, I don't think we have done two, three cases that is from a past institute from Rishikesh and we have done two, three cases and the main problem is locating and trying to pass the wire in the head of the talus, not into the neck. And that is the only precaution we took rest. I think all uh, precautions that you take. So the only thing is if you are putting the tailor wire, you should actually connect it to the tibial, tibial frame, frame, not onto the foot frame so. because then it will work. As a fulcrum yeah. on which you're correcting. Uh, the so, foot. sir, th that was connected to a second for the first ring of the foot. The yeah, yeah. Tibial frame. Okay. So that then you're correcting the foot with that as your fulcrum. Axis. Yeah. Okay. The second question is like, uh, uh, do you follow the product? Uh, what What do you do? How do you do the corrections? Do you take the patient again to the OT yes. to manipulate it? Yes. Two so, two surgeries. So first surgery is only for the four foot correction. And then second operation, we uh, connect the hinges again for anteriorly and posteriorly for the equinus correction and do a tenotomy or open release, whatever is needed in the second stage. So I think we follow a little different <laughs> protocol, sir. What we do is like we put everything once together and then after every two weeks, we'll be taking note to do kind of a ponsetti maneuver, correcting it maybe once, twice or thrice and finally for a maintenance phase. Yeah. So, I mean, there are different ways of doing it. You can... Uh, the Elizarov you can do without, if you put 
hinges at ex exactly the right place, you can probably correct it without anything, without having to take it. But it's very difficult to get the hinges precisely right. So I prefer to just distract and correct. So it became a problem during the COVID times because then you couldn't keep taking patients to the OR. Uh, thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, is Dr. Sandeep Vadya has come? Not yet. So do we have any more questions? Otherwise, we'll move to the video session of this session itself. And I think by some yeah. three, four, five videos, whatever Dr. Sandeep, where they will join us. So what we'll do is like, uh, it's literally four. Uh, we will give 10 minutes to Sandeep to do the team video session. Uh, yeah, we have the session up to 4.15, yeah, sir. 15. So, so whatever time that. we can utilize till that time. Sir. And let's hope by that uh, Sandeep is here. No, I, I want to go to the video session, the videos for Patna. Yeah. Okay, so uh, like the first two videos are not mine videos. It's basically uh, JBGS has uh, published a video and they are really good videos. So I thought that uh, instead of preparing our own video, let's show that video and we can discuss on that. Audio can yeah. This is a plastic model that was developed by Dr. Ponsetti to demonstrate how his manipulative technique is performed. The four components of the club foot are easily seen. There is a midfoot adductus, there is midfoot cavus, high arch, there is hind foot varus, and there is equinus. And it's important to remember that there are two components to, of the equinus. One is subtalar equinus and the other is ankle equinus. In a newborn or an untreated baby, the cavus is never a fixed deformity. The cavus can be reduced by simply elevating the first ray to bring all the metatarsals into a parallel position. Another way of looking at it is that you, you elevate the medial side of the foot until the arch appears normal. By reducing the cavus, it, bring, it brings the forefoot and midfoot in alignment with the hind foot, thereby allowing the forefoot to be a motor to move the hind foot. The fulcrum for the manipulation is the lateral head of the talus, where the red dot is placed. Dr. Ponsetti put no on the calcaneal cuboid joint because if you put, if your finger is at this point, it will block the movement of the hind foot. And this is what he calls Hiram Kite's mistake. The calcaneal cuboid joint was the fulcrum for initial correction by Hiram Kite. So by reducing the cavus, bringing the forefoot in line with the hind foot and using the head of the tail as the fulcrum, the entire Ponsetti manipulation consists of abducting the foot so that the entire foot moves as a whole around the talus. This simultaneously corrects the cavus by positioning it in a normal position. It corrects the adduction by abducting through the midfoot. And as you can see, it corrects the hind foot varus into valgus by the simple maneuver of abduction. By purely abducting with no attempt to dorsiflex the foot whatsoever, you can see that the foot will dorsiflex because the subtalar component of the equinus is reduced as the calcaneus everts underneath the talus. The final step of the Ponsetti technique is usually a tenotomy to eliminate the ankle component of the equinus. To reiterate, the Ponsetti manipulation for idiopathic club foot is as simple as one, two, three. One, you find the head of the talus by palpation. Two, you reduce the cavus to bring the forefoot and midfoot in line with the hind foot. And you do this by visual inspection of the bottom of the foot that you've made a normal arch. And three, you abduct. And abduction is in the plane of the sole of the foot. The plane of the sole of the foot is made up by the three points, the heel, the first and fifth metatarsals. 
And Dr. Ponsetti recognized that that was the external sign of the motion of the subtalar joint. So the initial abduction of the foot is in this vector, but as the foot corrects, that the vector changes from, the, from being this way compared to this way. So the vector always follows the sole of the foot. And as the subtalar joint corrects, the direction of the abduction vector changes. This is a plastic model that was developed by Dr. Ponsetti to demonstrate. Yeah, so any question uh, before we move on to the second video of plaster technique? The whole abduction of 50 degrees that we are supposed to get before tenotomy. What happens if we do it midway? Fine. Uh, see, like it's always uh, when we are at, at such meeting, uh, we have to follow the conventional teaching. But uh, what you said, I am doing the same thing in my practice. I do a tenotomy at a one plaster before the last plaster. So like say a child requires five plaster, I would do a tenotomy at the fourth plaster. And um, that's different than the conventional teaching, but uh, this is what I do it. And I feel that once you carry out a tenotomy, the correction of taking the foot into abduction and equinus becomes very easy and quick. And I, I feel that's my personal opinion. I have not done a, a double blind randomized trial so that I can't say that it reduces the number of plaster, but I, I do it one plaster before that. So as Ponsetti said, the definition of of an orthopedic surgeon, surgeon exactly. is one who modifies the procedure the first time he does it. Exactly. <laughs> so, sir, what do you mean that you do tenotomy and you apply the plaster at the fourth plaster? Yeah. So, is that the last plaster? No, no, no. There is one more After plaster. you, you yeah. apply the first. So, for how long you apply this fourth plaster? For one okay, week or longer? Fine. So, that's very important question because uh, a lot of people have an idea and they get confused that after tenotomy, we need to give a plaster for three weeks. I give like at seven days or 10 days, I change to the next plaster and that plaster, I keep it for longer periods, say like three weeks, because as I understood, we need to keep the plaster in a fully corrected position for three weeks. We are not giving three weeks plaster for healing of the tenotomy because it's anyway going to heal in the last plaster. Mm -hmm. So answer to your question, I, I do it after seven day, the next plaster. So I think there are some people who do a tenotomy in a very severe equinus as part of their cast. So during the first or second cast, yeah, that's in, we do it in do arthrogryposis also. Tenotomy and then do the thing in the patients with very severe equinus, but we wouldn't normally do it in the normal course of treatment for a idiopathic club foot. That's how, uh, um, like, let me tell a, a funny incident, like how I learned that. Uh, one of the patient, uh, I'm in Ahmedabad, and one of the patient in like say 2003 um, had a child, the IT person, uh, his son had a club foot. And at that point, the Google was not that common, but he wrote to Dr. Ponsetti. And Dr. Ponsetti suggested that you uh, go to the Dr. Ganjwala in Ahmedabad. So that family was traveling from Hyderabad to Ahmedabad for each plaster. At the time, the child had a severe equinus. And at the time of fourth plaster, I suggested that now we need to go for a tenotomy. He wrote to Dr. Ponsetti that Dr. Ganjwala is suggesting that uh, we need to do a tenotomy before the last plaster. So Dr. Ponsetti said that, no, 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 you need to go for a tenotomy at the time of last plaster. So, the father came with the reply of Dr. Ponsetti that Dr. Ponsetti has said that don't do a tenotomy. I said that fine, he is an expert and let's follow him. So I gave a plaster without doing a tenotomy. The child had a severe equinus. By the time he left hospital and reached to the airport, the plaster came out. So then he sent me the photo of that plaster and said that this has come out. So I sent the same picture to Dr. Ponsetti that this has happened. Now what we need to do? And then Ponsetti said that, yes, in such cases, you need to go for a tenotomy before the last plus. Yes. Okay. So why, why should the last 
both cast and not earlier. Yeah, so basically uh, the severe equinus that allows the cast to come out easily because what I think is like when the foot is in um, slightly more dorsiflexion, that's 90 degree allows the plaster or, or, or uh, works as a brake. Something like this, it, it works as a brace, but when it's in severe equinus, it comes out. No, but like then that. it should happen in the first or second cast yeah. rather than There is the an explanation poker. for that, sir. So what happened? It, because the forefoot is straight now. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> because initially the forefoot was deviated and it was working as a brake. Now it is straight. Yeah. So, <laughs> sir, that happened with me also, which I asked him for a couple. Then, uh, apart from that, I added tincture benzoin and... Uh, he, he suggested the same thing. Dr. So, Prezor, tincture benzoin is something thing. which we've used for 40 years now, 30 I mean, years. Because, and the synthetic cotton, it slips more easily than the normal cotton, so... We with, don't use synthetic cotton for club food. And finally, we did an early tin for that. Good old-fashioned. So, yeah, Dr. Ponsetti suggested to use tincture benzoin um, underneath the, um, the casting material so that it works as a, some resistance to slippage. Uh, Stukulian, does it uh, does it answer your question? Uh, yes, sir, it does. So the uh, question uh, was on behalf of the trainees. Okay. okay. Yeah. So now we are showing the second video. Again, it's a JBGS uh, uh, video section video. So um, let's see that video and then if we have any question, we will discuss. Dr. Noon is putting several turns of software over the toes then overlapping about the half the width of the soft roll as he moves up the legs, keeping it closely applied and firmly applied. So it is a thin layer of closely applied soft roll. We prefer to use plaster for our corrections. Notice he is placing several turns of plaster over the uh, holder's fingers to get a plaster all the way out to the ends of the toes, so there's a good toe plate at the end of the procedure. Notice he's keeping the plaster closely applied. And uh, I like to put some tension as I go over the hind foot and just roll it on as it goes further up the leg. Some people have had success with soft cast materials. Uh, I think they probably can be used for some feet, but for some of the more difficult feet, uh, we find that uh, the feet will tend to slip in soft cast and prefer plaster as the optimal and least expensive material. Now you'll see Dr. Noonan has taken the foot from the holder. He is wrapped in the layers of the, pl of the plaster. He is moving his fingers so they do not stay in any one place for a long period of time. He is making a good mold above the heel so the cast doesn't slip. He's using the index finger of his right hand to hold the abduction and the cavus reduction that was obtained during the manipulation. And the thumb of his left finger goes to the head of the talus where he remembers its position in his mind's eye, uh, again, as the fulcrum for holding the abduction. He keeps moving his finger so that no spot takes too much pressure so the baby does not develop a sore. He will continue with moving his fingers, but holding the abduction, using the head of the talus as the fulcrum and molding above the calcaneus to get a well molded cast to maintain the correction. The upper portion of the cast is applied after the lower portion has set fully. Soft rolls put on, again, not thickly, but well padded, especially at the top of the thigh so that there's a good layer of soft roll. Any irritation with a Ponsetti cast is likely to occur at the very top of the cast, so a number of good turns at the, at the groin are important. Again, the plaster is rolled on smoothly with care not to put any uh, tight bands in the popliteal fossa. Dr. Noonan has a pre-made splint you had previously seen using the roll to go back and forth over the front of the knee to strengthen the plaster at the knee without getting a lot of plaster in the popliteal fossa. Another simple technique is to use a preformed splint as has been done here. The knee is kept at 90 degrees. And 
again, this will hold the abduction of the foot and uh, avoid slipping. Short leg casts are ineffective because the plaster rotates and the abduction is lost and they are much more likely to slip. Again, the plaster is molded and held until it is fully set. This is the appearance of the feet after the first cast. The casts have been trimmed down to the MTP joints dorsally, but a full toe plate is remaining. This allows the toes to move and stretch out the flexor tendon. Yeah, questions related to this? Uh, casting is really important because uh, all of us are treating club feet and doing the casting properly is really the key to getting good results. Uh, and this point about not continuously pressing on the, so we talk about the head of the talus as the fulcrum, but it's important to keep moving your thumb and not keeping it constantly on the head of the talus because then you'll end up with pressure sores in that area. And I've seen that happen. So you have to be careful of just taking it off, putting it back on, but maintaining that as the fulcrum for your correction. Sleeping off. If it is a very uh, fatty child, chubby child, uh, uh, how do you manage your plasters? Yeah, the first thing is like uh, we can give more, or we can keep the knee in slightly more flexion instead of ninety. So that will that that is one thing I have thought of. I don't know any other option. The other is to use tincture benzoin on those and <laughs> use a very thin cotton yeah. roll. So then you reduce the chances of that slipping. I would suggest like, please use soft roll. Many hospitals, they don't have a soft roll available, particularly the uh, government hospital. But uh, for this, I think that it is better to use a soft roll instead of a cotton, which our uh, staff made from that big packet. Yes, sir. Soft rolls also, sir. So, so a small number of layers. So one layer only? Or yeah, one, one layer, one layer. So only. we have soft roll, but I prefer the cotton, which our guy makes. Because he's able, he's been doing it for forty years, and he does it does a great job of doing it. So. <laughs> because of money constraint, they don't give uh, soft roll. Uh, but uh, we have insisted for that because after using soft roll, the cast is all very good. Second, we can extend up to the higher part of the thigh, clearing the groin, and the chances of slippage of cast is less. And keeping the knee more flexed, again, we reduce it. The slippage of cast is less. In those cases only, sir, that I am, in those cases, you extend the cast higher up in the thigh, but how don't does, be in the mid thigh. So how does soft roll help you to extend the cast higher? No, sir, it's not about soft. Because if we are taking that uh, simple zigzag, uneven cast, uneven, and if it is not prepared nicely, it will lead to uneven casting. Yeah, if you have a. So I don't think the soft rule allows you to extend it more. It's just. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, sir, to add to what uh, Dr. Sukalyan said, in a chubby child, what I find is it is uh, initial days, it was very difficult to locate the exact uh, taller head where to put the thumb as the fulcrum. So your tip on that, how to locate the teller head where we start in a chubby child. Okay, so that's very, very good question. Very practical question. Whatever may be the weight of a child, chubby child, the lateral mellulus is always fat, right? So uh, we palpate the lateral mellulus. We go around one to 1 1.5 centimeter anteriorly and slightly downwards. And the first bony prominence, which we feel is literal aspect of head of Dallas. This is described in it itself, yeah. yes. Another uh, method which can help in these uh, chubby children is to extend the cast up to the tip of the toes so that the constant movement of the toes means uh, that pushback phenomenon is avoided. And this has been uh, published in a recent article in IJO. I think uh, they have described a tug test 
after uh, applying the cast, they give a trial of pulling the cast and they have suggested few measures like one of this is to extend the cast up to the tip toes. Uh, Hitesh sir, in Manipal, we, apart from the cotton, we apply the bandage. What is the reason for that, sir? You want the cotton not to slip? Generally, if you apply the cotton, we need to be extremely careful. It should not be to the constriction, number one. Second, if we view to only very thin layer, what is here in this video is there, I generally apply even thinner than this. And that is the reason to hold in that position, we need to put it. Dense cotton, but that is also any single layer only. That is the reason we used to put it. Sir, one question uh, How to move the roll of the cotton and the plaster of Paris for the left foot and the right foot differently? Very good question. Yes. Uh, if uh, someone has observed the video, they have very rightly shown how they wrap it. So that's that's a question, and uh, I'm not going to play the video again. But let's say this is a foot which is right side foot. So to roll the bandage, we should go like this. So each turn is trying to correct the deformity. So we have to go like this for the right foot. For the left, we have to do it other way. I ask this question because I practice this thing. Uh, the uh, uh, for the left foot I have to go so that the fourth foot is uh, supinated and for the right one we have to go in the reverse way so that fourth foot is my colleagues most of the they don't bother for that is why I uh, raise this question whether it is a pertinent point or not. That's very pertinent. Okay. Uh, sir, to your question regarding the soft road, if it's not available, one of my colleagues uh, in Gujarat, Surat Chirak Bhalwani. Uh, he used only bandage, no no cotton, only bandage, and yeah. then over there he applies plastic. And it is also practice because Balwani learned from Beller. Beller only put the about the only cotton, yeah. only bandage. So there are the people put the cotton only, the ready-made cotton, the old cotton, cotton with bandage, or only bandage. So people just use the tubic grip, the just yeah. the yeah. All are acceptable. In Russia, they are not using bandage or not a cotton. All just direct they are doing. <laughs> Is it because of the cost or it's because of the technique they are working with? So coming to the next question, sir, do we still use and recommend DB shoes? Because there is a trend which I am seeing mainly, especially in this part of. India, uh, the orthotists, they don't know what is DB shoes. What is the current recommendation now? So it's not DB shoes, it's the stain back brace. It's different from DB it's shoes. It's not the brace, uh, the walking shoes after nine months. Oh, that's, that's a very important question. If we have one more a positive pigment and we have got a good correction, I don't give any special suit for this. I'm not talking of the right place. That's different. For daytime, I don't view DB shoes or uh, base heel or something like that. Because I think that a well corrected foot does not need anything except the routine thing which other child has. <laughs> what about you? So that's my usual practice. But when they start getting a bit of uh, uh, recognition, yeah, yeah, then different. we. I, I do give the for DB shoes if I see about the dynamic forefoot adduction or I should do see about the child walks with the adduction. So that during daytime, that will also hold in the character. Up to what age? Up to uh, three years. Three years. So when that will only happen after the child starts walking. Yeah. 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 So what do you do from three months to nine months? That's great. But only daytime, only nighttime breaks. Nay, nee, full day, 23 hours. I will give the more. Let's reduce it 23, then 20 hours. But I will give it. Daytime also breaks. Yes, sir. Let's say, like, see, now this is a very controversial point, and we would like to have a, a like, uh, know the opinion. Let's start with the. Uh, so, what is your time? Let's like, say you have connected the uh, club code with five clusters at the end of two months. So now two months. Onwards. Yeah, so first three months, uh, I would give a, a Dennis Brown splint uh, at least 23 hours a day. And then every month, uh, go on decreasing the brace time by around one hour per month. And uh, this is uh, 
till I reach 16 hours per day protocol. And once the child starts walking, I continue with her CTV shoes during the daytime and uh, splint at night. Means so CTV practice. shoes, DV shoes again. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. DV shoes. Again, just to add, sir. Up to the age of three to four. There years. are people who are giving AFO. Is that acceptable? Recommended? What, sir? Because when I send for DB shoes, they give AFO and send the patient back. That is what the problem is here. Okay. I use AFO, only AFO in the brace. So instead of a simple shoes, I use AFO when child is bringing out the foot out of the brace. So I think that uh, if you want or if child wants to bring the foot out of the brace, he has to plant a foot. Then only it's possible to bring out the uh, brace. So in that case, Maybe like say six months, seven months down the line when family says that now six times a day or seven times a day, the child is bringing out the food from the brace. In that case, I convert it into AFO type of uh, shoes. But again, the rest of the thing is same. Um, 60 or 70 degree uh, Excellent. rotation, acceleration that is there. But only if it's coming out, otherwise not. So the, the recommendation with the Ponsetti Thing for the bracing. Firstly, it's this Dennis Brown splint is confusing because you should call it a abduction like brace. A stin -back. Yeah, stin back abduction brace or a foot abduction brace. Uh, now, the recommendation from the Ponsetti school is 24 hours for the first three months. After that is night and nap times. So that's what I follow. So does, does this mean no one else follows that? No, I follow almost... No, it doesn't make it 16 no, no, no. hours, yeah? Eight hours at night and maybe two or three hours during the day, yeah? An infant uh, sleeps for about 14 hours. <laughs> so that comes to like, say, 14 to 16. Hours. Till the child starts walking. So we don't give shoes, because at that we stage, there, why do you need shoes? shoes? No, sir. If they're not walking, why do you need shoes? No, sir. Till the child is non-walker, the child is in a splint. That is the steam bed. The moment child starts walking, it is a normal shoes. Yeah, welcome, Dr. Sandhya. Yeah, so to keep the keep the keep the correct uh, position of the uh, foot, we child need to, is we need to give the shoe. Yeah. Splinters, child is walker. The moment child is awake, that is walking, normal shoes. Normal shoes, yeah. This is we follow. And if there is any recurrence Even I do follow the same. Accordingly, we treat. So now we come to the most important point. A uh, lot of people, they ask about tenotomy, a lot of concern, a lot of questions, confusion. So first of all, uh, we will discuss a theoretical point briefly, and then we will see the video. So the first question is, why do we need tenotomy? That's the question. Almost 95 to 98% of my patients, idiopathic variety, they need tenotomy. Why they need tenotomy? The reason is because the foot is in equinus. The structures which are responsible for this equinus are three. The main culprit is short tendo Achilles. And second, the posterior capsule of ankle and subtalar joint. All three are shown in this picture. Now, when we try to correct this equinus by dorsiflexing the foot, something like an arrow which is shown over here, and if posterior structures are not getting stretched, in that case, the foot will break at midfoot. Now you will say, I have not seen that. Let me show you my own mistake. In my earlier practice to one family, I suggested that now we need to go for tenotomy. And they were a bit worried about tenotomy means it's a surgery. And they said that, no, no, we don't want any surgery. I was also new to Ponsetti technique, so I said that, uh, fine, we will go without uh, tenotomy. And after the treatment was over, the foot, of, the foot of the child looks like this. Something like, it, it made me uh, worried because the shape was not normal. So I decided to go for x-rays. Mm -hmm. To clarify, I don't take x-rays routinely. In this patient, I was worried about the rocker bottom foot. So I got the x-ray done. 
and it showed that yes there is a rocker bottom food so this is iatrogenic deformity which i have created because the posterior structures were tight and they did not get stretched with the dorsiflexion push and the false correction took place at midfoot so if we do a tenotomy and take out the major culprit the remaining two tissues that's a posterior capsule of the subtalar joint and the ankle will get stretched in most of the idiopathic cases by plaster technique and we get the correction so that is why we do a tenotomy in what percentage of cases do you need tenotomy in my practice 95 to 98% of cases hitesh in your 95 98 sir almost the same yeah so that means that not all the cases the milder variety can be treated without tenotomy the technique of tenotomy that's again a very important thing the child should be relaxed how is is your personal preference we can do it with knife or we can do it with needle the needle 20 gauge needle tip is also sharp and can work as a knife there are various techniques but the technique which i prefer i am describing and we need to go from medial to lateral side that's the important thing the reason is because there are important neurovascular structures on medial side so when we start from medial to lateral side and instead of that if we go from lateral to medial and if we extend our knife then we may damage the neurovascular structure so it's always better to start from the side of neurovascular structure and move away from it and the most important point always at the end of tenotomy you should feel a pop sound even your assistant who is not touching the knife he is away from the patient will also hear that sound so if you don't listen that sound then then think that probably your tenotomy is not complete so we are looking at the child from behind we are looking at the heel it's a, the leg is horizontal so these are the tendon achilles and the tendon the calf muscle and the tendon these are on a upper side that's a medial side there are neurovascular structures so we put a 15 blade knife parallel to the tendon once we are in the skin then we rotate it 90 degree so that the cutting edge of the blade is towards the tendon like this and once we do that then we go from medial to lateral side and we cut the tendon and at that point we should hear a click so this is a video of my colleague is operating so look at the blade is parallel to the tendon then he he rotated it 90 degree and then he go from medial to lateral side and at that point you should be getting that pop sound and once we do it we will feel the gap and we are able to get dorsiflexion usually 10 to 15 degree dorsiflexion should increase after tenotomy coming to the question like many chubby child we are not able to feel tendon achilles so in that case it is better to make a small incision pass a artery forceps and get the complete tendon out or like in in vision and then cut it rather than going on blindly this is a simple technique we may need a one stitch after this procedure any question yes yeah, so uh so you don't you may not always hear a pop but you should get feel that sudden give give it yeah that's yeah. it yeah that is important because uh otherwise you probably have an incomplete tenotomy if you don't get that sudden give so i i have made a practice that after tenotomy i don't write anything else in my note but i always mention whether i got the pop sound or not 
because I consider that as a very important thing that I have done a complete tinotomy. Sir, uh, I've seen some people going for rather than a single through and through incision or uh, the entire cut through. Some people prefer four or five stab incisions and uh, one on the lateral side, one medially, again lateral medially, and then they tend to dorsiflex. And in that case, you won't get a pop and rather it's a crackle so uh, sort of a sound. Uh, your opinion regarding this technique? Fine for a like say newborn or oh, sorry the young child less than six eight months I think this works really well. I have not done it so I am not the right person to opine on that. But yes, in the past when we used to carry out uh, Z lengthening instead of Z lengthening, a uh, lot of my colleagues they used to do three incision blindly and then they used to stretch it uh, for the various cerebral palsy or something like that. But personally, yeah. I have not done it for club foot. So we do that fractional lengthening in the CP cases where you don't want to over correct. Okay. The idea is that you are not dorsiflexing the foot. You're just getting it to neutral and you want the tendon to be in contact with the thing. And you need three cuts because the TA is rotated. Otherwise you should just two should have been enough, but because there's a rotation of the fibers of the TA, you need to do it at three places to get a complete cut of the TA at one point or the other. And then you can do that. But for club foot, you want to do a complete tenotomy. That's the idea. And 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 as I showed you in that thing, they, the TA heals completely. Okay, There may be some fibrous tissue in it, but you it is solid at the end of it. It doesn't matter. Even if you do a complete tenotomy, you separate it by one centimeter, eventually it's going to heal up completely. Okay. So if you are talking about that hook or white, I don't think that is recommended for CP, sir. For? That is recommended for an isolated equinus in an older fraction, child. No, so now we've stopped. Now we do CP, fraction. It's a, it is, so, but at one time we were you you do that if it was a equinus which was not corrected by flexing the knee. So yes. you had to do a TA. Okay, yes, you could not do a release at the uh, gastroc. This thing. Yes, sir. Otherwise, not more more often we do a gastroc release rather than a TA release. But, yeah. So what he is asking probably is for an older child. Uh, fine, the video uh, was very clear, but 1.5 centimeter about the insertion of that. Please don't go near the tendo. Uh, sorry, the don't do it at the insertion. The reason is because in that case, the tendo achilles has slightly fanning and it becomes difficult and you may injure the bone. So one centimeter to 1.5 centimeter, it's the the tendon is better palpable at that point. So we do uh, at that point. So if you try to do it right at the junction, the calcaneal, the, the uh, cartilage is actually softer than the tendon. And you're more likely to cut into the cartilage than the tendon. Okay. Uh, what has your personal experience been with revision tenotomies? And uh, what is the maximum age till which you would do a tenotomy? Okay, already we discussed. You're, you're late, questions. Sandeep. <laughs> Uh, so a situation. But that itself says that those are very important questions. We already discussed that, but that they are very important questions. So a situation. Uh, we have taken an infant for tenotomy. We have performed a tenotomy, but we are not getting the dorsiflexion. How do you approach that? Okay, a good question. Uh, particularly for a newborn, it's okay. But otherwise, in older children, what I have done when I have anticipated this will happen, I have kept the K-wire ready. I insert a K-wire in the long axis of uh, calcaneum and use that as a joystick to uh, dorsiflex the foot. But that is in a child who is one, one and a half year where I anticipate that tenotomy has been already done. I'm doing a repeat tenotomy and I may not get uh, full correction. So instead of flex, uh, uh, giving just a dorsiflexion push, which will result into flat top tellers, I try to give a direct force to calcaneum. Again, my experience is only two cases, but that is what I have done. So if you had correction to close to neutral in your casting, and then you're not getting dorsiflexion, that means your tenotomy is not complete in an in a idiopathic club foot at, in a small child. Okay, so then I think you have to find ways of making sure your tenotomy is complete, do a mini open, make sure there'll be some fibers. Which, so one, one of the things that happens is when you go medially, you actually spear through the tendon. And you cut laterally, there's one little bit in the medial, which is still there. 
because your knife has actually speared through the tendon and not gone medial to the tendon. So you need to make sure that you've cut it completely. So inevitably, if you do not get dorsiflexion when you've thought you've got your complete tenotomy, it means your tenotomy is not complete. Okay. So there are many ways to do it, and uh, um, the prosthety, the prosthety supporters say that even if you don't get a dorsal section, you can still apply the plaster on with whatever dorsal section you got, revisit the plaster again at one day. If you're sure that you have got your tendon actually is completely cut, then only things that are uh, remain to be stretched are the ankle and subtalar joint of the capsules. And as a uh, so that's more common in the slightly older child, very rare in the really young child. Sir, how do you confirm that uh, tenotomy is complete in a teratologic, like in these difficult situations? It is very difficult to be sure that. So for those ones, I do like a mini open, make sure that I've got the tendon completely like was shown there. And make sure I've cut through it completely. Now, okay. shifting to the last topic of this session, Dr. Sandeep is here. We had the, the question on this topic initially. Okay. Uh, and luckily, you are here to answer it. Okay. Fine. So, uh, hello, Patna. I'm glad to be back here. Just after a few months, you know, I was here a few months ago for the HIP symposium. And uh, thanks, Jaswinder, for having me here again. So uh, we have already covered all the basics of uh, CTV and now I'm going to discuss one problem of CTV which is not very uncommon and that is dynamic adductus. So first let us understand what exactly is dynamic adductus. So suppose that this is a child with uh, bilateral CTV. He has been you know, appropriately and adequately treated by Ponsati protocol of serial casting, uh, manipulation and tenotomy following which he has been, the correction has been maintained by application of the foot abduction orthosis. Now he's reached the walking age and as you can see, his feet are pretty well corrected. But when the child starts walking, uh, okay, look at the left foot. What is happening to the left foot? The left foot is going into supination and the initial contact is on the lateral border of the foot. And this is what is dynamic characters. Now a recent paper which was published in 2022, uh, multi-national uh, uh, team of experts, they proposed a criteria for, you know, diagnosing dynamic adductus in a child with CTV. And these are number one, during gait, the forefoot should go into supination during the swing phase of gait. And the initial contact should be along lateral border of the foot. So that's during gait. On clinical examination, if you child ask the child to dorsiflex the ankle, the forefoot will supinate with respect to the leg. And initial contact being along the lateral border of the foot, you will see callosities along the lateral border of the foot. So these three criteria have been proposed for diagnosis. And the cause that has been proposed for the causation of this uh, dynamic adductus is imbalance between the tibialis anterior and the peroneal muscles. That is imbalance basically between the inverters and the everters of the subtalar joint. So is dynamic adductus a relapse? And there is a bit of controversy regarding this. There is a group of authors who says that yes, it is a dynamic relapse. But there is another group which says that imbalance is something which is inherent since birth, it is only that when the child starts walking, it becomes manifested and therefore technically this cannot be called a relapse. This is something which has been present right since birth. However, one thing is clear that if dynamic adductus is not addressed, then it can lead to a fixed deformity and a fixed relapse. And the incidence is variable, you know, depending upon how you define dynamic adductus, the incidence is various reports has been between 11 to 50%. So now that there has been is a standardized definition, probably we will get a more clearer idea in future studies as to what is the real incidence of dynamic adductus. Now, you have to be very careful before treating dynamic adductus to separate the dynamic deformity from the fixed deformity, because the fixed deformity has to be addressed before you treat the muscle imbalance. Therefore, if there is a fixed deformity, then you have to treat it either by serial casting, which is definitely the first line of management for a fixed deformity, even in an older child who is relapsed, 
or by appropriate surgery, which can be, you know, depending upon the situation, you know, soft tissue releases for equinus or cavus or virus. And in older child where there are fixed bony deformities, you may have to resort to bony osteotomies. So that's about the fixed deformity. Now let's come to the treatment of dynamic adductors. Now, since the cause of dynamic adductors is muscle imbalance, the treatment obviously is that we have to rebalance and we have to restore the muscle balance. And the surgery, the go-to surgery for that is well established in literature. It is the tibialis anterior tendon transfer. The surgery of tendon transfer that is done here is the entire tendon is transferred to from the base of the first uh, metatarsal to the lateral cuneiform. Okay. Contrast this with CP where you do a split transfer and you uh, the split part of the tendon, you transfer it to the cuboid. Here you don't transfer to the cuboid. Here the entire tendon is transferred to the lateral cuneiform. And the timing should be after the age of 2.5 years. Why? Because it is after that age that the lateral cuneiform ossifies. Because, so if you do before that, then you are going to insert your tendon into cartilaginous bone and that uh, insertion may not be strong enough. It may give way. So coming to the surgery per se of tibialis and uh, anterior tendon transfer, this is not a new surgery. This has been described way back in 1940 by Garcio, who described it uh, by using the three incision technique. And what he did was he transferred the tendon to the base of the fifth metatarsal. Garcio himself then modified it in 1967 and transferred it to the lateral cuneiform. And Ponsetti and Smalley in 1963 described the uh, two incision technique where again he transferred it to the lateral cuneiform. So there has been some evolution of technique. Now, which is better, two incision or three incision? Now, there have been cadaveric studies on that. And what they have actually shown is that the three incision technique, in fact, gives a more direct pull onto the lateral cuneiform. And the evergent force is more with the three incision technique. And therefore, this, these authors, they, on the basis of these findings, they recommended that in stiffer foot, you use the three incision technique. But practically speaking, I have been using, personally, my personal experience has been, I have been using the two incision technique, have not faced any problems with it. But I know two colleagues of mine, pediatric orthopedic surgeons, who have been using the three incision technique. Now, I think we have a technical video uh, later, but I will just quickly run through the technical steps. So... This is by the two incision technique, one medial incision, one lateral incision. The medial incision is for exposing the uh, insertion of the tibialis anterior on the first base of the first metatarsal. So here you have to open the sheath, but you have to take care that the extensor retinaculum has to be preserved. So this is very important step. You don't want to cut the extensor retinaculum because if you cut that, then you will get a bow stringing of the tendon. The tendon is then released and uh, the stitch is taken. Uh, this is a one number y krill stitch. Then through the lateral incision, you have to identify your lateral cuneiform. Here I have shown the CM picture, but generally if you, you know you, uh, you have done a few of these, then the CM pick is not needed. The lateral cuneiform is in line with the third metatarsal. Make a hole in the third metatarsal, then uh, get the tendon from the lateral incision, uh, from the medial incision into the lateral uh, lateral incision through the subcutaneous tunnel and then tie it at the sole over a button. Okay, so it's a straightforward uh, technique. There is another study by Herzenberg which shows that the structure at risk on the sole while making the drill holes are the medial and lateral plantar nerves. But if you direct your, you know, end, exit point on the sole, Maximally towards the center, the chances of damage to the medial and lateral plantar nerves is minimal. Post-operative above knee cast for six weeks. After six weeks, cast button removal followed by mobilization physiotherapy. Bracing, uh, uh, it, it is not strictly recommended over here. It is not uh, done in most of the studies. I uh, take a call depending upon the individual case. If the case, child is a bit stiff, then may I may recommending light night time bracing for a few months. The results are generally good. This is a you know almost a 45 year follow up study of, of uh, from the Iowa Institute, and they have shown that the TBLS anterior tendon transfer is very effective in preventing additional relapse of deformity without affecting long term function foot function of patients with idiopathic club foot. So to conclude, dynamic adductus is a dynamic deformity due to muscle imbalance. It must be differentiated from fixed deformity, which should be treated first. 
and treatment is restoration of muscle balance by TBLS anterior tendon transfer. Thank you. Hello. Any yes. questions? Sir, how much dorsiflexion do you give by uh, putting a tying in? About 10 degree dorsiflexion. Not the maximum, right? That is generally what is possible in this. Because the, uh, already a flat top tailor set is there. But the, some of the latest literature suggests here, sir, here. Yeah, yeah that uh, a split tendon of the tibialis anterior has a better result rather than to come. That is recommended in cerebral palsy. So cerebral palsy is a condition where the muscle is spastic. And you don't want to transfer the whole, you know, muscle laterally because then that will result in a you know, reversal of the deformity. In club foot, it is always a full tendon transfer, but in cerebral palsy, you do a split tendon transfer. It is not recommended. Split transfer is not recommended for CTV. Sir, I have a question here. Yeah. Uh, uh, how often do you feel any skin necrosis at that place where you tie and yeah, so to manage? Use a very it, thick right? camji pad on the sole before, you know, using the button. If you do that, generally skin necrosis chances are not very high. Another thing is in the initial part of my practice, I used to use ethy bond a lot, two number ethy bonds, yes, but that does give skin reaction in lot number of cases. Now I start using the Vicryl. So the Vicryl, another advantage is many times after six weeks, when you remove the cast, the button comes off along with the cast. You don't need to cut, you know, that additional trauma of removing the button is uh, the child doesn't have to endure. So that is another advantage of one number Vicryl. Thank you. Hello, one question. Uh, is dynamic uh, adductus is a separate entity or is it always associated with some uh, CTV correction or something? It is a part of club foot. And uh, as I said, you know, the exact figures are not known, but, you know, going from my experience, I feel that at least, you know, 10 to 15% of cases have of club feet have a dynamic adductus, which then becomes manifested in the second year of life and then has to be addressed later on. Why am I asking this question? Many of the parents come with the child uh, one and a half to two years and they come and they show that when the child walks, the forefoot get adapted and a bit supinated. So you have so to be very careful in differentiating metatarsus adductus yeah. or, or even intoing. You know, most common a child, a toddler who comes intoing without any birth history of CTV is, you know, intoing because of femoral antiversion. Yeah. Or he may have some, you know, met adductus. Okay. So uh, that is a completely different entity. You see, in met adductus, the foot is adducted at the metatarsophalangeal joint. Okay. Whereas in this, this dynamic supination, which I talked about, actually it should be called dynamic supination rather than adductus. The foot is supinated and therefore the initial contact is on the lateral border of foot. So this is a different entity and you have to differentiate it. This is seen in children who had club feet at birth and who have been treated for club feet at birth. So yeah. you mean that uh, four foot adduction, adduction should never be associated with the supination of the no, no. So, so metatarsus should land flat. Varus or adductus is a different entity which is fairly benign and doesn't often need treatment, except in very severe cases. And what I wanted to ask is when you're doing a recurrence in an age of say four or five, where would you add a tip and transfer at the end of your treatment? And if so, would you do the tenotomy at the same time or would you, would you do it separately? No, I would do it at the same time and I would do a tip and transfer if I'm doing, you know, operating for a recurrence in an older age. You, you wouldn't just do a tenotomy in those? No, I would come in a four or five year old, I would combine it with a tip and transfer okay. because that, uh, after that, you don't need to do bracing. This is an internal brace kind of thing. Yeah. So in dynamic adduction, dynamic adduction uh, is there anything to assess it or is it only the visual thing which we see? It's here? a careful visual gate analysis and clinical exam. There is no investigation by which you can, a radiographic parameter by which you can say that, oh yeah, this is dynamic. Because it's a dynamic thing. It's occurring during gate. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, myself, Dr. Arvind, yeah. doing lots of sports at Paras Hospital. So I do uh, this biceps tendon, you know, this is with you know, this is a screw or something uh, many a times, so I have lock and all these, in which you don't need to drill complete through and through. So any uh, experience of that? 
with the so, use of that uh, so that. pediatric orthopedic surgeons are very poor surgeons they don't have access to those bio absorbable or fancy interference so, screws so I one way of making it more expensive <laughs> actually what we what has been probably recommended also that uh, you don't rely solely on the suture which is there on the plantar side at the end of the surgery you have to pass sutures yeah. through the cartilage of that bone and cartilage of the cuneiform so you are anchoring on the top the bottom is just like a check ring a bone yes. it has been which, described what yeah. you are saying has been described yeah. you know uh, yeah, yeah yeah people who have access to that those bioabsorbable screws <laughs> interference screws they are using it but you know our class of patients i mean we want to keep the cost to a minimum yeah, yeah. so thank you very much sir so with, and we are over shooting the time yeah. so we close this session yeah, now yeah we close thank you uh, thank you chair persons thank you sandeep sir so it is time to felicitate our chair persons dr sandeep sir uh dr amulya sir please come forward sir next uh ivanand sir sir aap hi ko dena please for all the four chair five chair persons Dr. Bashir Alam, sir. Dr. N. Sir, N. K. Singh, sir. And Dr. Ramit Gunjan, sir, please. so thank you all the chair persons uh, thank you sandeep sir uh, we move to the next session and uh, dr rajiv ranjan the next session it is on uh, congenital vertical talus good afternoon everyone uh, good afternoon everyone our next session is on cvt congenital vertical talus i would like to invite our uh, respected chair persons uh, dr bharat sir sir no, no, he is not here uh, dr okay. nk sir sir dr madhusudan ho gaya hu uh, dr madhusudan sir dr madhusudan sir and uh, dr vk thakur sir vinod thakur sir uh dr bhuvan sir please come and chair the session thank you sir. and dr ikram dr ikram sir please i now i call upon dr dheeran please dr dheeran please your talk on pathoanatomy and diagnosis and errors please so kindly don't leave the hall we have coffee after this session and uh, we will having again lot of burning questions yeah so in this uh, session i will try to uh, create a platform so that the subsequent lecture becomes very easy for you to understand so uh, congenital vertical talus there are a lot of synonyms um some people call it congenital convex pes vulgus rocker bottom foot congenital rigid flat foot now we need to remember that unlike vertical sorry unlike club foot where majority of the cases are idiopathic here 50% of cases are associated with the spina bifida arthrogryposis or chromosomal abnormalities so 50% of the cases are idiopathic remaining are secondary the points which we will discuss are the pathology the diagnosis and the treatment rationally i am not going to discuss anything about treatment but i will just give a, break, a background like why we need to treat these children 
So pathology, I'm going to show you a few pictures and I want you to tell me what abnormalities you see in the, those pictures. What do you see in this child? What, what is abnormality? Yes, it's a vertical talus. What do you see? Loss of, loss of arch of foot or reversal of arch, like good, then equinus, very good. And the forefoot is in dorsiflexion because there is a, like a hind foot is in equinus and the forefoot is in dorsiflexion that results into reversal of arch. Yes, that's one of the deformity. Yeah, we will we will discuss that. Yeah, what do we see over here? Pronated, yes, inverted, abducted in valgus, abducted and inverted. Very yes, good. Inverted. And over here. The forefoot is uh, abducted, not adducted, abducted. And we see the medial side uh, of the foot more prominent. Here, there is complete reversal of the arch on a little side of the foot. So the pathology is like if we combine everything, the pathology is hind foot is in equinus and vulgus. The forefoot is dorsiflex, abducted and everted. The plantar surface is a rocker bottom. So instead of a convex, uh, concavity, there is a convexity. And the important thing which we cannot see from outside, but when we understand the pathology, there is a dislocation of the telonavicular joint. That's the most important pathology of the vertical talus. So if we see this, the little aspect of the foot, the talus is shown in green. If we draw a long axis of talus, usually it is in line with the first metacarpal. But in vertical talus, if we draw the talus itself is vertical, it's in plantar flexion, and the long axis of talus is not in line with metacarp metatarsal, but it forms an angle. And that is because of the uh, dislocation at telonavicular joint. If we look from the top, again, the talus is in green. Usually, the long axis of talus is in line of the first metatarsal. But in vertical talus, the long axis of talus and the axis of the first metatarsal, it's not in straight line, but they form an angle. And the forefoot is abducted like this. And if we uh, see this, the soft tissues, the tendo Achilles is short. This is the arch of the foot is reverse. So both tendo Achilles is short and the arch is absent or is reverse. The structure on the dorsum, that's a tibialis anterior, is again short because there is a dorsal dislocation of telonavicular joint. So now the most important thing, how to diagnose. For that, in a case where we are not sure, where we are in dilemma, we take a lateral x-ray and we know that the long axis of talus and the long axis of metatarsal, they are in straight line. So they are in straight line like this. This is normal. Case one, this was the x-ray. Now, if we draw a line, this is long axis of talus. And this is long axis of the first metatarsal. It's not straight, but it forms angle. And the first metatarsal is dorsally angulated. Now, the most important thing is like, when we are suspecting a dorsal dislocation, we need to take the forefoot or the foot into plantar flexion, and then we need to take a lateral X-ray. This is the most important thing for diagnosis of vertical talus. So now the same patient, we have plantar flex the foot and now we are drawing the lines. So this is the long axis of talus and this is long axis of metatarsal. 
first metatarsal, but still they are not aligned. It's still dorsally angulated. So this confirms the diagnosis that this is vertical tear. Lateral view, lateral view, lateral view in full plantar flexion, maximum plantar flexion which is available. Case two. This shows that uh, there is a talus is vertically oriented. This is long axis of talus and the long axis of metatarsal. Again, it's, uh, it looks that it's dorsally angulated. Now the same foot when we plantar flex and we draw a line that says that they are almost parallel. Means this is not vertical talus. Some people call it oblique talus. Now, the third point, the rationale of treatment, why we need to treat this condition. So we treat this condition for variety of reasons. This we need to tell to the family when they come to us, when they present to us, and when we say that the child requires surgery, and most of them, they are not really agreeable to the option of surgical treatment. So at that point, we need to explain them that appearance is one thing, but the more important thing that this leads to abnormal weight bearing. And if we don't treat it over a period of time, it leads to callosity and pain. So these are the reasons why we need to treat. So the take home message is about 50% of the cases of vertical talus are secondary. The lateral view in plantar flexion is very important for making a diagnosis and treatment is required for prevention of pain. Child does not have pain in the initial few years. The pain will appear later on. So always families are very reluctant because the preventive concept is not popular in our country. So we really need to take efforts to explain them about the requirement of surgery in this condition. Any question? Or we take questions later on together. Thank you. Now I call Dr. Sukalan, please. Drops casting technique. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, organizers, RF India, OCN, and Paris Health. So Diren uh, sir has always been a great help to me. And uh, today also he has made my job easier by setting the stage. So um, the end point of casting session, the foot life looks like CTV. That could have been the last slide of the first slide itself. So let us go and elaborate that. So we are going to discuss about Dobbs technique, which essentially includes casting technique, but it's not just limited to casting itself. Just like Pirani's, um, just like Ponsetti's concept, the Dobbs technique consists of well-laid down protocol, which the author had first described in late 2006. And again, he has made some changes in 2015, both those articles are freely available. So the steps are pre-treatment radiographs, serial manipulation and casting, which is popularly known as reverse ponsetti technique, which essentially includes five to six plasters to be particular. Uh, and then again, clinical assessment, radiograph at the end of the casting with the plaster on, and then proceed for surgery, which I'm going to skip because Dr. Hidesha is going to take it, and then post-op protocol. And now pre-treatment radiograph uh, have already been taken care of by Thirensa and there are the only three radiographs that we take, AP view to um, measure the talocalcaneal angle, the lateral view in maximum dorsiflexion, which shows persistent hind foot equinus in the form of reduced tibio calcaneal angle, and a lateral view in maximum plantar flexion, because there is a dorsal subluxation of the navicular as evidenced by, as already described, uh, increased Taylor axis first metatarsal base angle or tamba. So these two views are necessary and sufficient for a vertical, vertical talus to be radiological diagnosed and to be treated. Now manipulation casting, uh, everyone present in this room knows about Pirani um, Ponsetti technique of casting, right? So then you can very well do the Dobbs technique of casting as well. In vertical uh, talus and uh, club foot side by side, in vertical, uh, vertical talus, the forefoot is dorsiflexed, as we have already learned. There is abduction, there is valgus in comparison to forefoot, plantar flex, electrics, and varus in club foot, and equinus is common to both of them. Now, steps. 
If you remember, uh, during the onset casting, we used to stand on the lateral side of the child so that the manipulation and um, correction becomes easier. We stand on the opposite side because now we have to manipulate it on the medial side. Locate the medial aspect of the teller head, just like we located the lateral aspect of the teller head. And uh, it is in similar position. Uh, so as to say, it is uh, just a finger breadth anterior and distal to the medial malleolus. So medial malleolus is one of the bony prominences that are uh, very familiar with us. So there should be no problem in um, locating the medial head of the talus. Now the hand position. So this is a um, vertical talus model here and there is a CTV model here. So we take the thumb over the medial aspect of the talus head and we go just the opposite that we used to do in club foot. So bring the rest of the foot into plantar flexion, inversion, and adduction. And uh, as in Ponsetti technique, we do not try to correct the equinus. And um, there is a one exception uh, in vertical talus with respect to <coughs> club foot. That is the, in club foot, we have a special fast plaster technique, but here all the plasters are similar. In all of them, we are going to place our thumb into the fulcrum, which is the medial aspect of the head of the talus and bring the rest of the foot into plantar flexion, inversion and adduction. We do not lock the calcaneum as in club foot and let the hind foot go into varus by the uh, virtue of kinematic coupling by indirect method. So here you can see the congenital vertical talus at the end of the manipulation should go into varus. So the serial plaster endpoints uh, the hind foot should be in mark varus and the foot should be foot should look like an untreated club foot. The one on the left side was actually a vertical talus to begin with, but now it looks like an untreated club foot. How many plasters to put? It's five to six plaster, whether or not the deformity is corrected. At the end of the uh, plaster session, that is that includes about five to six plasters, we take a lateral view with the cast on. And that essentially means in maximum plantar flexion. And that correlates with our first radiograph and then we can easily correlate with that. Now X-ray is going to tell us what to do. If the teller axis first metatarsal base angle is less than 30 degrees, we are going to proceed for surgeries, which we are going to do even if it is more than 30 degrees. So what does it uh, tell us then? If it is less than 30 degrees, we just um, put the foot in corrected position and pass a retrograde cable, easy and simple. And then we do the tenotomy, which will be taken care of by heat assessor. If it is more than 30 degrees, then we should be ready with joystick reduction with the help of cables. That is the only thing that the radiograph is going to tell us. Now, what is the post-op protocol? We skip the surgical part and then come directly to the post-op protocol. Ankle should be casted in neutral. At the end of two weeks, we change the cast and put the ankle at 10 degrees of dorsiflexion, which remains there for another two weeks. So at the end of six weeks, we're going to discard both cast and the KOR. And we employ a shoe or and bar brace for two months, uh, similar to that we see in Steenbeek's foot abduction brace. This should be continuously 23 hours a day for two months and then only during nights and naps until the child starts walking. And uh, they used molded air was during walking and bracing at night. That shoe and bar system has no inherent dorsiflexion, no abduction. So in all respects, it is neutral. Till what age? It should be till two years. But why do we wean so early? As Dobbs said, the relapse rates Interestingly, in vertical talus are much lesser than club foot itself. And all the relapses could be traced back to our inability to correct a good reduction at the time of index procedure. I would also take the opportunity to have many more discussions on all aspects of pediatric orthopedics in the 38th Annual Conference of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, which is going to be held in Guwahati, 16 to 19 Feb. I hope I can reciprocate all the warmth and hospitality I received here. All are welcome to register. Thank you.
Hitesha, please. Posterior capsule release. Thank you, Sukalan. You made my job the easier. Actually, I'm going to talk on the surgical management, but before uh, going into the, the surgical management and the congenital vertical talus, he has very nicely emphasized the difference between clubfoot and CVT. One of important issues there, CVT is rare than the clubfoot. Number one, it's clubfoot is very, very common. Second point, which Dhirensar has already said, is half of the patients are not idiopathic. Again, while clubfoot, most of the, we are fortunate to have the idiopathic clubfoot is common. Third, the Ponsetti techniques works very well in case of the clubfoot, while the reverse Ponsetti doesn't work very well. Because if you see the Dobbs result, it's very good in the Dobbs hand. But if you see other than Dobbs, not only in uh, the India, not only in South Africa, so not in the Europe, not a single center from U uh, the USA also reciprocate the same technique, the same result with the DOPS. So the amount of the surgical reduction or surgical intervention is required in CVT is more than the clubfoot, definitely much more than the clubfoot. Third, the DOPS has, he has very intelligently mentioned 2005 publication and 2015 publication, but major difference between the DOPS uh, two publication, he mentioned very importantly the Parkinson's technique in a closed manner. But later he came into that, whenever he came with the closed manner, the recurrence is higher. And he said in the last recurrence is very, very less. But that means he has to open the telonavicular joint. So what actually happened in case of the vertical talus? In one sentence, you have to say that there is a dorsolateral dislocation of the telonavicular joint. And whenever there is a telonavicular joint uh, uh, dislocation, because the talus doesn't have any, any muscle, any tendon unit, it is very, very difficult to reduce the dislocated joint. If child presents very early, yes, it is very good. There are a number of the reasons. Number one is 50% of them are non-idiopathic. So maybe having neuromuscular. Second, it's a mechanical issue. So it is different. It's not easy to reduce it by the putting in, a, whether it's a fulcrum in a vertical talus and the clubfoot is different. He mentioned very well. And the third difference is there, we do see the child with the older age, where it is very, very difficult because by the time we'll see the child, deformity will be very, very rigid. That those cases will require about the surgical intervention. Yeah, I, I will cover some part of the types of surgical intervention outcomes. So Dhiranbhai has already mentioned, I'm not going in detail. He also mentioned the appearance, weight bearing, and it's very important that if they don't present in India, we'll see the callosity is very badly callosity and we expect to have a plantigrade foot and it is supple and functional like a normal foot is very, very, very difficult to get. And we do still see the patient is present in the adult and they came with the pain and it is also very, very difficult because it's a stiffness and the pain in the non-treated is very simple to treat in a very young child rather than going into adolescent or adult. The aim of the treatment in vertical talus, whatever it is there to restore the normal relationship between mid-tarsal joint, that is a calcaneocuboid and talonavicular. Calcaneocuboid also goes along with the talonavicular and second joint is a subtalar, that is a talocalcaneal joint. To get about the supple foot and that is, that's mobile foot, it looks plantigrade. And then the third is to maintain that. We need to get it maintained till the child will become the adult. There are the options. The Sukhalan has clear very nicely about serial manipulation. That is absolutely correct. In an older patient required the soft tissue release, which I am going to say that there are ways for the tendon transfer. People like to do about tibial is anterior transfer for on the to the talus to prevent the recurrence in a neuromuscular cases. In older patients, navicularectomy and subtalar arthrodesis is there, particularly when child present beyond the seven years and beyond 12 years, as rightly mentioned, telon. The triple arthrodesis is less and less, but if it is a painful and stiff, not in the primary for that. What is required? The in, in, in reality, the less than one year, it will be amenable for the serial manipulation and minimal invasive for the telonavicular reduction. If older than two years, it will require most commonly in the soft tissue release, though the Dobbs himself suggests that you can do the serial manipulation up to 12 years. 
I'll emphasize because he said the serial manipulation is in his own technique is acceptable. He doesn't do the soft tissue release. But this is my personal experience. An older patient will require about soft tissue plus minus the navicolectomy or a subtalar fusion. And older, more than 12 years, it's required triple arthrodesis. I'll directly go on a surgical aspect, which I go with the dorsal incision. If it is an oblique talus, I put a very small incision on a talar navicular. If it is re do required to have a late presented with the, all the deformity will present the hind foot equinus, hind foot valgus, purpose, abduction, eversion, then it will require the complete, the subtalar as well as the mid joint release will require about dorsal incision. That is the general incision of mine that is on the dorsal approach. That is a two incision. First to address the, all the dorsal structure from the dorsal incision and second incision on the posterior aspect to address about the tando Achilles and the posterior structure tightness for the subtalar and ankle. Previously, it is described by the horizontal incision or a vertical incision. There are both are described in the literature, but we generally used to take about the dorsal incision. We were actually, when we started that, we were scared that dorsal incision will have the necrosis, but we didn't find any problem. Yeah. See, this is the pathology what Dhirenshara has said that what is needed is to, to have a talonavicular reduction. That is the key part of the surgery is to reduce the talonavicular joint. So after the, uh, as Sukaland mentioned that all the four plasters, if you take the child under the anesthesia or the tendoacular stenotomy, if it is the, we need to say it is the oblique talus, it's reducible. We can put about the, like he mentioned about temba, but most of the people say is excellently mentioned, but there is a temba is less than 30 and temba is more than, is a talo angle between the talus and first metatarsal that we need to take about the base between that. But in reality, if there is a reducible, we can put about the wire between talonavicular joints. If it is not reducible, we need to open at, the talonavicular side on the medial side. So uh, what is required, we need to do for the soft tissue dissector, either the McDonald or the Dura elevator, between that, get into the plantar surface, put the wires into retrograde, take out on the backside and do about the joystick, get it in align and pass the wire. That's the, actually the basic surgical principle. So We'll go on a different step. That's a dorsal incision. We dissect on the medial aspects and the lateral aspect. This is the lateral aspect. We do about the peroneus longus and brevis. Do about the lengthening of peroneus longus and brevis. And particularly, I prefer the go on a calcaneo cuboid opening because the talonavicular joint is at same line. So it would be easy rather than because the talus is tilted in so vertical and navicular sitting on dorsal. Sometimes it is not very easy to go in between, but if you go between a calcane cuboid, you know that is a level of the talonavicular joint also. So it will make us the job also very, very easy. Then go on the medial side, do about the tibialis anterior lengthening and tag about the tibialis anterior. Release all the dorsal structure, EHL, EDL and peroneus tercel, keeping in mind the neurovascular intact. And as I said, go from the, the lateral aspect and medial aspect, see the head of talus is present on medial. You can go with the, the knife and get cut about the capsule, teranavicular capsule, and we can see the, the head of talus is visible. You can able to lift the head of talus from the magnonite. This is the before <coughs> reduction. This is the after reduction. Pass the wire from the anterior to posterior. The, and the wire can be brought out from the posterior aspects. Get it a joystick, get it reduced, get a good arch and pass about the, the wires. And we can see that it's a very good arch after the reduction. Many people prefer about the tibialis anterior transfer to the talus. I suggest, I, I recommend only in the neurovascular cases because where there is an imbalance or there are higher chances of the recurrence is there. Otherwise, we'll do about a lengthening and put about the cast for the six weeks, wire and cast to be out after six weeks. There are a few cases. There's a child with a multiple congenital contracture with the deformity. It's a vertical talus, not getting reduced in the plantar flexion x-rays. This is a post-operative x-rays. That is a three-year follow-up. Child is having quite reasonably foot plantigrade. And these are the x-rays. This is a second, ex second child. So it is a two and a half year with a vertical talus. This is a four-year follow-up with the uh, reasonably looking the foot. 
These are from the medial aspects, and then these are from the posterior aspects. These are the X-rays. The other child, so this is the dorsal flexion and plantar flexion after the dorsal incision. We hardly see any incision. You can see the scar mark on that, which it healed quite well. These are the two and a half year old child's and after the healing, it's quite okay. Arch means with that. This is the another child having follow up after the five years. The dialysis looks reasonably okay and the clinically also looks okay. Few more cases. That is a multiple congenital contracture with that we can see about the drift of the toes, which is not getting corrected with the vertical dialysis. It is persisted actually. Few radiographs angle that is a telonavicular joint has been open widely, like in uh, Clawfoot. This is a quite reasonable and then similar to the, for the other angle between the lateral view to the allocalcanian angle. We can have the complication as I said, surgery will be associated with complication. We may get about the blood supply of the talus will get affected. That may be having avian or flat top talus, maybe having persistent subluxation or sometimes it irregularity like that. Can't see only the good result. We do have the irregularity in the navicular. Similarly, the flap top talus in such, such case. And some challenges in the older patients where we need to do about the soft tissue release with the other procedures because the only the soft tissue release cannot address everything. A patient may develop a bony deformity, which we need to address it. Like this child is having the severe callosity with severe abduction. The child was treated with the soft tissue release and still it will be the persisted and we have to address about the subtalar fusion now. So in conclude the soft tissue release during dorsal approach is gives good result, reasonable result. An idiopathic patient will have a better result than a non-idiopathic. Thank you. Uh, thank you. After uh, removal of the cast and the KOIs and everything, how you maintain the, how you, any braces and what, how you deal we, the patient? We, we put the braces in a well-molded ankle foot orthosis. Ankle foot orthosis is used yeah. only for three to four years and five years. Generally orthosis. give for the one to one and a half year. One if it's getting better within that, it's fair to discard it. Okay. After one and a half year, discard it. Okay. Brace. Thank you. Thank you, it is. Uh, now I call all the speakers. Uh, please come. Do we have more questions? For questions and any questions, please. No. For the per percutaneous do you, taking. Do you suture the TBL is anterior to the T like transfer? Yeah, only on the neuromuscular. Otherwise, do the lateral. I do the lateral not anymore. Okay. And uh, subtalar fusion, do you mean Grice Green? Uh, if you are doing in a say five, six year old. Yes. If if it is that generally less than five years doesn't require subtalar fusion because in our experience we did up to six years, it works very well. But between six years to nine years, we have to do about the Grice Green process. Sometimes it is like a very, very severe navicular is up that we can't do about the lengthening of that, the medial column, we have to size the navic. So, Dr. Ritesh Pandey. Sir, just to, sir, what your experience uh, regarding three incision processes? Yeah, we used to do about the, We have used two or three cases with this. Three. Yeah, but the, what I said that the ultimately you address the dorsal structure, lateral structure, yeah, and yeah. posterior structure. Yeah. So, there are the three incisions. So, if you do with the two incision, it will be okay. If you do with the three incision, it is okay. Because uh, your uh, anterior incision is something long like and something like uh, anterior Cincinnati type incision. Yeah, but it, it works well. Okay. I can understand we used to do about three incisions also before. Thank you, sir. See, once you try this uh, dorsal approach, sir. you will see that it gives wonderful exposure. Once yeah. you do it, then you will not resort to three incision technique. That's thank you, sir. The percutaneous technique, with the percutaneous technique, uh, how much time would you need? I mean, how many times or percentage wise you'll need the soft tissue release along with that? If, if child presents very early, if child presents very early and it's idiopathic, it will work well with the percutaneous technique. If child is present beyond six months and non-idiopathic, most probably they will require about soft tissue. 
do you think oblique talus you know the modified dobbs works yes oh yes so probably his series is, is you know oblique talus yes yes one of the problems with vertical talus is it's a mixed bag of cases and if you have a majority of oblique talus you'll have excellent results but if you have mostly arthrogryptic really bad uh, vertical talus whatever you do do they do badly so you have this uh, kind of range of presentations which uh, are some are so i mean we, like i and I, i know one or two cases where it's run in the family with arthrogryposis and whatever you do to them they do not correct <laughs> they, i mean not fully i mean they'll correct but exactly yeah so they can be really challenging you would do for vertical talus how would you you know exactly differentiate between an oblique talus and a severe flat foot okay that's a very good question and uh, i must not say but uh, hitesh me and vincent mosca are uh, doing one study uh, following x rays and we are trying to define this criteria at this stage we don't have any clear cut criteria to differentiate this let's hope that uh, we may get some uh, results from our study and in a year or so we will be able to tell well what is happening we have a same question and we have for like technical more factor related i mean they are yeah yeah they are thought to be flexible plant what happens to them see there there are the the three component of that the vertical talus is very very severe where there is a completely flexible foot is very very benign and somewhere the oblique talus is in between but there is no fixed criteria for to define all three for cvt is very simple to do it's it's very very simple to define because it's not getting reduced it's a vertical talus but between the oblique and the flexible flat foot is very very difficult also yeah but the fortunately for the orthopedic surgeon or pediatric orthopedic surgeon if deformity is getting the fix then he is going to intervene so it is like that so even the, the criteria is not defined they know about the treatment yeah 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 flexible flat foot also in the after he will get tighter so now we are coming to case based discussion ditesh please thank you sir i thank uh, john sir dr jaswinder and uh, the whole organizing team for making me a part of this event and uh, after uh, having seen the beautiful results of uh, dr hitesh sasar's cases i will be presenting uh, two cases of cvt where uh, the results of surgical treatment were satisfactory but uh, they were not optimal and uh, i think all these discussions uh, apply to my cases and it will generate lot of further discussions so this was first case a 5 year old girl known case of spina bifida with bilateral calcaneo valgus foot deformity and this is how she was walking the deformity on the left side was uh, severe and it was quite stiff whereas on the right side it was flexible and completely reducible on manipulations so these were the ap images and uh, although the deformity is uh, appearing to be more severe on the right side as i told the right side was flexible and it was reducible whereas the left side was uh, more stiffer and these are the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion views of the left foot which was a stiff foot and uh, here as we can appreciate the telonavicular joint is partially reducible and uh, there is 10 degrees of dorsiflexion in the dorsiflexion lateral image whereas on the right side the deformity is completely reducible and good amount of dorsiflexion is also possible so the following diagnosis was made for this case on the left side we have a congenital vertical talus which is partially reducible whereas on the right side we have an oblique talus 
And this treatment algorithm was uh, uh, followed for this case, which was published in Journal of POSNA in uh, uh, February 2022. And it says that even in neglected cases, all the cases should receive a trial of serial stretching casts. And if the deformity is reducible or even partially reducible, then one can try Dobbs method of minimally invasive uh, treatment. Whereas if it is a stiff foot or a recurrent case where the deformity is not reducible, then more extensive dorsolateral releases uh, with or without bony procedures are needed. So the same treatment was done for this case. Uh, she received serial reverse sponsity casts followed by uh, Dobbs method of treatment consisting of uh, open reduction of telonavicular joint and a TA tenotomy. And these are the intraoperative images. It is showing good reduction uh, on both the images, both AP and lateral views. And these are the images in cast. The same treatment was used for both the sides, both left and right foot. Even though for the oblique talus, we used the Dobbs method in this case. And post-operatively, K wires were removed at six weeks. Cast was removed at 12 weeks and an AFO was continued thereafter. And these are the results. Uh, this is how she was walking at the end of six months. Uh, there is significant uh, improvement on the left side, which was more stiff, but on the right side, which was flexible, it is uh, the deformity has again recurred. And even the radiographs at six months are showing signs of recurrence here. This is for the left foot. And the status of right foot, which was oblique talus, the status was same as it was in preoperative period. This is another case, again, a five-year-old boy with uh, left calcineovalgus deformity. Here it was idiopathic because I could not find any underlying cause in this case. Uh, there was a history of dorsolateral release a couple of years back and the foot was quite stiff. And these are the images of uh, the deformity. We can see the scar line of previous surgeries. These are the radiographic angle showing uh, deranged uh, alignment and a vertical talus. So here we made a diagnosis of idiopathic congenital vertical talus, which is recurrent and it is a stiff deformity. And again, the same algorithm was uh, followed. We gave a trial of serial reverse ponsetti cast, but that didn't give any improvement and an extensive dorsolateral release was done, open reduction of telonavicular joint uh, was done. And as uh, Hitesh sir told, uh, I prefer to do a tibialis anterior transfer to the tailor neck in this case, followed by a TA lengthening. And uh, these are the images again, both lateral and AP views is showing good uh, reduction and good alignment. And these are the intraoperative images showing uh, uh, good deformity correction. These are the images at three months post-op. But again, at six months, the radiology is showing uh, the signs of recurrence. And as per the literature, the, uh, there are various papers with uh, different percentage of recurrences quoted. And, uh, Few papers have quoted a recurrence rate as high as 67% for Dobbs method and uh, up to 30% for extensive releases. And uh, it varies and it is more for older age and uh, in teratologic CVTs. So now the cases are open for discussion and uh, like what went wrong and what else could have been done in these cases. So these were the various options which uh, were discussed by Hitesh Sasar also in his PPT. So what could have been done further to improve the results? First case, which is having spina bifida. I think we need to check about the muscle imbalance because there is a, uh, I think the first case, which is very severe on the left side and right side was supple. The left tibial is anterior is very, very tight. And uh, 
what has been addressed because tibial is anterior if you do the lengthening also that you may do about weakening because the plantar flexion is not working and dorsiflexion is there. that's why it's going in a lot of calcaneus type of thing Com compared to left side left was stiff and right was not stiff the right has not been addressed that's why right looks little off it probably needs something like a how old is the child five years old sir. yeah something like a grice green or something like that because it's not gonna it's a it's not gonna work with soft tissue uh, surgery okay and uh, for, for the left I, I guess you needed more uh, a so, better uh, release and a better reduction of the angle of the talus so i mean even if uh, how long did you keep the k wires k wires for uh, six weeks six we weeks plastered for uh, three months so uh, even if intraoperatively one is getting good reduction, good alignment, then should they proceed for extraarticular arthrodesis in those cases? In this scenario, not in a, during the first time. But if we say it about during the first time, if you see the underlying neurological imbalance, you can balance it because otherwise it will recur in okay. case of the neurological. That's why the non-idiopathic are much more difficult. Uh, sometimes it's unpredictable. If you do the surgery at two and a half, three years, you cannot uh, find out the muscle impact. Generally, it's not because surgeon's fault. Because we cannot detect it. It's retrospectively we can detect. It's not the fault of the surgeon. So that generally because of the etiology, we can't find. The website is just extreme calcaneo valgus rather than a true vertical talus. Yeah. It's like because of the extreme calcaneo valgus that talus is kind of looking down. So I think you need to correct the bony relationship of the thing and something like an extra, at this age, probably an extra articular arthrodesis. Later on, you may have to do a complete uh, further arthrodesis if necessary once the child is the older. The role of uh, the medial column shortenings in these cases like... Uh, yeah, it is described also yeah. the medial column shortening. That's why we discussed that is a difference between lateral column and medial column. Medial column is longer. So sometimes you need to do about the osteotomy and do about the shortening. It's also described. Something like wedge tarsectomy on the medial side. Medial. Reverse of the club foot. When we do about the cuboid, the e nucleation or cuboid osteotomy or mid tarsal osteotomy or lichfully osteotomy. Same thing on the medial. Yeah. We can do about the, the me, uh, no cuneiform. Is, medial is on cuneiform mostly. On if it is severe, then you have to take it out, excise it. How does excising navicular behave, sir? It be, it doesn't behave very well because it will compromise the two joints. Actually, it will compromise the proximal and distal. So it the movement would not be happening. So this would not be considered as a first option. This is the last option. So it will take care of the length part, but the joint between the talus and the uniform is not really a good joint. It can do. Actually, it's the people try to do about the osteotomy or the two level to preserve the joint. But again, it can lead to the, its own complication. Like you can do about the medial cuneiform osteotomy and the shortening osteotomy of the navicular. But again, they will have their own problems. So in practice, sir, what will be your recommendation means up to what age one can go for these joint preserving procedures and as far as possible, we should because if you in, in case of the spina bifida, the if you fuse the joint, it will lead to the other problem like a trophic ulcer will have if the person has got sensation problem. So uh, as far as my concern, I treat this this spina bifida not very aggressively due with the surgery. I will do the brace them raise them and check about that whether the established muscle imbalance is there then only I will do intervention. You probably have to delay your surgery as much as you can rather than do something in a rush because uh, these spina bifida behave very well and, and the muscle imbalance is something which you need to look at because uh, the weaknesses also whether the spina bifida has been adequately addressed so some of them may have tethering and the neurology may actually get worse with time. So, yeah. need to. Sir, when we are proposing the medial column shortening as one of the treatments for this thing, we are correcting it away from the fora. We are correcting it distal to the fora. We are not primary correcting. This is that the recurrent skates, relapse skate, where he's tried everything on a telonavicular, but still column is longer. 
then we have to sort it. so if the teledynuclear joint is still subluxed and we are uh, not subluxed it you need to get it reduced then you only do okay, reduced and pinned and, and then we are reducing the uh, medial column by doing a wedge resection from the femur point and if the so still there is no restraint for the teledynuclear joint to stay in place if at all it collapses it i mean if it had a tendency to collapse it will collapse it will form as a deformity tendency to collapse it happens because talus doesn't have any the muscle talus behave from the front and from back so it is not that's why it is happening in relapse why relapse happens in the non idiopathic cases it's not an idiopathic case so so my thought is like uh, isn't uh, gray screen a better way to approach this problem rather than doing a medial the gray screen will you just address about only subtalar what happened talonavicular it will collapse also is like a flat foot gray screen is also not option not a correct option not for the correct option also the medial column is not addressed then gray screen also will fail exactly in a cp in case of the cerebral palsy the extra articular arthrodesis will came in so much thing believe me in gmfcs 4 and 5 4 particular 3 and 4 even though it extra articular it will collapse so gmfcs 4 and 5 we do telonavicular fusion also 3 3 ha so, so that is that can be an option here yes telonavicular option is there but again more and more fusing is not a good idea for the spina bifida that's why we say it. don't do that in case of spina bifida fusing end up with source yeah end up with source it's not a good idea to do the fuse so uh, we don't have a video session uh, now and uh, we'll close this session may i felicit ask dr ritesh pande to felicitate our chairperson dr vinod thakur sir we'll break out for coffee after just just let us do the felicitation dr vinod thakur thank you sir sudan sir dr madhu sudan sir thank you sir dr bhuvan sir please डॉक्टर एकक्रम सर सो वील ब्रेक फॉर द कॉफी नाउ फॉर नेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी मिनट्स एंड वील कम बैक फॉर द सेशन फ्लैट फूट एंड टार्सल कोलेशन थैंक यू
Hello, good evening all. Uh, moving on to the next session, uh, flat foot and tarsal coalition. May I invite our chairperson, Dr. D.K. Sina sir, Dr. S.S. Jha sir, Dr. Juvendu sir, and Dr. Bikas sir. Please come to the stage, please. May I invite our first speaker, Dr. Sandeep, sir? Sir, please. Okay, so, so far we have covered uh, CTV, probably one of the most common pathologies that uh, we see in the pediatric foot. Uh, now we will go on to flat foot, which which is not a pathology, but there are a lot of, you know, myths and, you know, misconceptions and fears in the minds of the parents. And, you know, it is our job to dispel those fears based on scientific evidence. Uh, as we go along in this session, we will realize that most of us, you know, many times we, uh, to allay the anxiety of the parents, we often do irrational practice, uh, things like, you know, every child with flat foot, we uh, there is a tendency to prescribe insoles and then I'm sure that, you know, as the talks go along, we will see what is really the scientific evidence, you know, which children should be prescribed, which children should not be prescribed, what is the evidence in favor and all this. So my job today basically in the first talk is to just to talk about the pathoanatomy, the types and differential diagnosis. And this is what I'm going to talk about. What is flat foot exactly? What are the types of flat feet in children and what are the differential diagnosis, right? So what is flat foot? It is loss of height of medial longitudinal arch of the foot, right? But this is a bit of a layman's uh, language, a bit of a, uh, as orthopedic surgeons, we are more interested in uh, knowing as to what exactly is happening at the osteoarticular level. So at the osteoarticular level, flat foot is a condition in which the subtalar joint, it's stretched to its maximum limit of eversion. Now, let's understand what I mean. You know, it, eversion and inversion of the subtalar joint are not as simple movements as they seem to be. So, subtalar joint, uh, uh, have we covered biomechanics of uh, subtalar joint in the first session, CTV session? So, it is more or less like a ball and socket joint, right? Like the hip joint, we have the femoral head, which is the ball, which rotates in the socket, that is the acetabulum. In the subtalar joint, we have the tailor head, which is the ball, and the calcaneum, the navicular and the spring ligament, they form the socket. And unlike the hip joint where the femoral head, that is the ball rotates in the socket, in the subtalar joint, it is the socket, that is the calcaneopedal unit, which rotates around the ball, that is the tailor head. Okay. So furthermore, the axis of the subtalar joint is not exactly either a sagittal axis or a transverse axis but it is an oblique axis. The net result of this is when we talk about eversion, eversion actually is a complex three-dimensional movement in which the heel goes into valgus, external rotation and dorsiflexion. So eversion, the heel goes up and out. Inversion, the heel goes down and in. This is because of the, you know, the complex arrangement of the axis of the subtalar joint. And it is very important to understand that. So flat foot, when I say that the heel is everted, it is in valgus, it is in external rotation, and it is in dorsiflexion. All the, it is a three-dimensional movement. Now, having spoken about the you know the pathoanatomy of the flat foot, we now come to the types of flat foot. And the first, when we define flat foot, we have to rule out any underlying pathology. So flat feet can occur in the presence of underlying pathology. Most commonly neurological problems like cerebral palsy, spinal dysraphism, or in conditions of excessive ligament laxity like trisomy 21. Now, this is a different category of uh, uh, disease, which is to be you know, treated differently. And we are not going to cover that in this particular session. What we are talking about is flat foot in the normal child, the neurotypical child. And these flat feet are basically of three types. That is flexible flat feet, Flexi flexible flat feet with tight TA and third is a rigid flat feet. Okay. So first let's talk about flexible flat foot. Okay. So this child has flat feet on weight bearing, but 
the arch reconstitutes and the subtalar joint inverts on toe standing. So this is what I mean by flexible flat foot. The child actually has an arch, but when he weight bears, the subtalar joint inverts and the arch collapses. So that is flexible flat foot. Another common clinical test which is used to diagnose flexible flat foot is do the jacks toe extension test. So you do the jacks toe extension test, the plantar fascia by its windlass effect, it will reconstitute the arch. So this is how you can identify that the child has a flexible flat foot. Another you know, clinical finding that you have in flexible flat foot is that the subtalar joint is freely mobile. So how do you look, uh, how do you check for the, you know, the movement of the subtalar joint? You cup the heel in your palm and then you invert and evert the heel. And if the, that movement is free, you know that the subtalar joint movements are free. So these clinical signs tell you that the child actually has a flexible flat foot. Associated with the that, the child may have generalized ligamentous laxity. So you should also check for ligamentous laxity in other joints. Now, what is the natural history of this flat feet? Okay, so this has been extensively studied and uh, we know that almost all the babies are flat feeted. Almost all the toddlers are flat feeted. Okay, but as they grow, as, they, uh, as the age advances, the incidence of flat foot decreases. And by the age of adolescence, only about 20% of, you know, adolescents have flat feet. However, if the flat foot is flexible, most of them remain asymptomatic. So flexible flat feet, you know, there are studies, population surveys, which have been done, which have shown that almost 20% of the adult population is flat footed. However, if the flat foot is flexible, then they don't have any problems throughout life. Okay. So this led to the famous aphorism by Lynn Stiley that flat foot is usual in infants, common in children and within normal range in adults. Now we come to a second subcategory and it is important to understand this subcategory that is flexible flat foot with tight TA. And why it is important to recognize this because many times when a flexible flat foot is associated with a tight TA, it becomes symptomatic. The child experiences pain on the medial side underneath the plantar flex tailor head and also the child experiences pain on the lateral side at the level of the sinus tarsi. So what happens in a flexible flat foot with tight TA is all the clinical features that I mentioned previously in flexible flat foot, they are present. In addition, the child has a tight TA. Okay. Now the important question is how do you check for the tight TA in a flat foot? So for to, to check for the, you know, the tight TA, you have to first lock the subtalar joint in inversion and then dorsiflex the ankle. Why this step is very important is because if you fail to lock the subtalar joint and you just try to check the ankle dorsiflexion, remember that the subtalar joint also has some element of, you know, dorsiflexion. And the dorsiflexion which is actually occurring in the subtalar joint may then be confused for you know dorsiflexion of the ankle so in order to check for the true dorsiflexion of the ankle joint it is important that first lock the subtalar joint in inversion and only then check for the ankle dorsiflexion another important test that you have to perform is the silver stool test because this test will then tell you the difference that where is the uh, tightness arising from is it an isolated gastrocnemius tightness or is it a tightness of the gastrocnemius and soleus? Knowing this is important because as we will see later on, even in the CP session, that this will guide our surgical management. If this child goes in for surgery, what is the choice of surgery that we are going to offer? That depends on the results of the silver shield test. Now, contrast to, you know, flexible flat foot, rigid flat foot is a condition where the arch cannot be restored. Even when the child is not weight bearing, the child is going to be flat feeted. These children have restricted subtalar joint mobility. This is more commonly seen in adolescents and the most common cause of rigid flat foot is a tarsal collision. And in tarsal collision, the commonest collisions are between the calcaneum and navicular, that is calcaneum navicular, and between the calcaneum and talus, that is the subtalar collision. And in flexible flat foot, there is uh, no need to do x-rays unless the child is symptomatic. But in a rigid flat foot, always you have to do x-rays in order to identify whether the child has a collision. In a calcaneonavicular collision, what you will see on x-rays is 
uh, a calcinonavicular collision is base, best seen on the oblique view. And on the oblique view, you will visualize the collision as you can see over here. My arrow is visible. Yeah, so that is the collision. Additionally, on the lateral view, you will see the ant eater nose sign. Okay, so these two radiological signs you will see in case of a calcinonavicular collision. In a uh, telocalcaneal collision, it is difficult to see the actual collision, but you can see some uh, surrogate signs. So one sign that you can see is known as the C sign of Latour. So that is one surrogate sign for a subtalar collision. However, mind you that this is not a very specific sign. Okay, subtalar, uh, the C sign can be seen even in, you know, uh, re, uh, flexible flat foot. So this is not a very specific sign. So that is one sign that you have to look for in a suspected telocalcaneal collision. And the other sign that you have seen, you have to look for is this spurring of the other tailor neck. Why this spurring occurs is because there is excessive stress, because there is no mobility on the subtalar joint. There is excessive mobility at the telonavicular joint, and that leads to this spurring that is occurring. However, the best way to diagnose a telocalcaneal collision is a CT scan. Okay. In fact, whatever be the telocalcaneal collision, uh, whatever be the type of collision, you have to go for advanced imaging that is MRI or CT scan, because that will tell you, give you more details about the anatomy of that collision, if you're planning a resection. And also if it will tell you if there are any more collisions, like you may have a calcineonavicular collision, but in association with that, you may have more collisions. DD, there is not much but the most important differential diagnosis for a flexible flat foot, especially in a toddler, is the congenital vertical talus or more importantly, the oblique talus. Many times the oblique talus may be confused for a flexible flat foot. And we were just discussing this in the last session. How do you differentiate? So the sole is convex plantar word. The uh, talonavicular joint is irreducible or in case of oblique talus, it is partially reducible. And the diagnosis is on the basis of X-rays where the first empty axis remains dorsal to the Taylor axis and it fails to reduce on the plantar flexion view. So to conclude, flat foot is a position of maximum eversion of the subtalar joint. It is flexible flat foot is physiological in children, but its incidence decreases with age. With tight TA, the children can have symptoms and rigid flat foot needs to be evaluated further with X-rays and advanced imaging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. You have definitely elaborated the pathoanatomy and classified flat foot. Thank you. Well, when you said there is a type which has got tightening of or contracture of tendo Achilles, can we say that these are the symptomatic flat foot which are still flexible? So, uh what you are saying is perfectly right. Probably there is a subcategory of flexible flat foot, which failed to resolve at adolescence. And additionally, they develop tight TA. And these are the children who become symptomatic. So if I, in, uh, if, if at in toddler age, there are hundred percent children who have flat feet by adolescence, probably only 20% of them would be having flat feet. But even out of those 20%, only about three or four percent may have symptoms in the form of pain under the tailor head and laterally at the level of the sinus tarsi. And most commonly, those who have pain, they have a tight TA. So probably the tightness is something which occurs secondarily and comes on, you know, during the adolescent. That's why they become symptomatic at that right. age. I would like you to overemphasize about the jack toe extension test also. Absolutely. Because many of them may not have become conscious of this very important test where you have to differentiate in a very small child whether this child is having flat foot or not, especially in the light of the fact that newly born babies, they have pad of fat placed in the arch, which normally uh, vanishes in about two years. Sometimes it may be even late. So this test is really very helpful. Absolutely. Right. Yep. Uh, you have rightly pointed out the various deformities and uh, the coalitions that are present. There could be bony coalitions. There could be cartilaginous coalition. So how do we make differentiate? 
So in the presence of, uh, you know, uh, strong clinical suspicion, so you have a symptomatic rigid flat foot, there is no subtalar mobility, yet your, you know, x-ray is not showing any, uh, you know, signs of collision. The only alternative is to go for advanced imaging. Now, even in advanced imaging, M CT is considered generally the gold standard. But even CT, you know, if the collision is in the fibrous stage, but it has already become symptomatic, it may not pick up those fibrous collisions. And therefore, there is some recent literature which suggests that, you know, probably MRI in such situations can be helpful. So MRI will show you the fibrous collisions, number one. MRI will also show you some bone marrow edema patterns, which suggests that there is a lot of stress occurring at that area which is the explanation for the pain. Uh, Sandeep, I would also like to know uh, if there is an entity called spasmodic flat foot. Yeah. And uh, so then how do uh, we proceed? Peroneal spastic flat foot, uh, again, is a, you know, uh, uh, terminology which has been used to describe, you know, painful flat feet. Though, you know, today's textbook, they don't really uh, explain what exactly it means, but what you know, happens in peroneal, so one cause of peroneal spastic flat foot is tarsal collision. Another explanation is, you know, when there is an inflammation of the subtalar joint, which can occur in either rheumatoid arthritis or infection like tuberculosis, etc. What happens is, for the subtalar joint, the position of maximum comfort is the position of eversion. And in order to draw that subtalar joint into eversion, the peroneal muscles, they go into spasm, and they go into spasm and they become painful. And so you get pain along the, you know, the line of the peroneal, peroneal tendon and that, you know, entity is, has been described though it is, uh, I mean, uh, it tells you what is happening. It does, it does not tell you what is the exact cause of we the flat foot. So that has to be investigated. Cause. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. Uh, well, friends, we are discussing flat foot in this scientific session. And I think flat foot has both the extremes. On one side is conservative treatment. On the other side, we have operative management. And so in the conservative management, maybe many of the times we have to treat the guardians of the children than the patient themselves. So now the subject is open conservative treatment and errors by none else but Dr. Ritesh Runu from IGIMS. Thank you, sir. Respected chairperson, sir, my seniors and colleagues. Dr. Sandeep has very nicely elaborated on the flat foot causes and uh, types. I'll be discussing about the conservative management of uh, planovalgoid foot. This is a very common condition we usually see in our clinical practice. In a pediatric age group, child presenting with flat foot. Many a times it is a concern of parents and most of the time I should say, and very few patients we, we get because of foot pain. That these patients are presenting with foot pain. So they are the mat, there as a physician, we have to find what is the cause and how we are going to treat these patients. So in pace planners, uh, we have already gone through the varieties, flexible and rigid type of flat foot. And one variety which Dr. Sandeep has highlighted and it has been that compensatory flat foot that is due to tight TA. So in flexible flat foot, by simple examination, tiptoe st standing and by simply extending the great toe, we can find out whether it is a flexible flat foot or it is a rigid flat foot. If the arch appears and the patient is able to and heel valgus has corrected. If you see here, the heel, both the heels are in valgus. But the moment child stands on the toes, that valgus heel has corrected. It has either it is in the straight line of the calf or it is in the virus. So it means it is a flexible flat foot. We have to quantify whether this flat foot is severe, very severe, or it is mild. For that, we usually use a few of the criteria. Taxan has highlighted a clinical criteria. A child is standing, it's a flat foot, and child is sitting, non-weight bearing. There is still the flat foot. The arch is, arch appears that it is flat. It is a severe type. 
the child is standing flat but while non weight bearing there is no uh, that arch is appears arch appears it is moderate type and if arch is present while standing or while non weight bearing it is a mild variety stallis index there we uh, measure the most narrow part of the foot uh, in uh, podogram that is the midfoot and we uh, divide it with the widest part of the heel that is this is stallis index and normal is less than 0.5 to 0.5 0.7 another criteria which is more accurate that is kipok smirak index here we divide the most narrowest part of the foot on uh, podogram from the widest part of the foot that is the forefoot and from this we can uh, decide how what is the grade of the flat foot already we have discussed about cvt and uh, other rigid causes of uh, flat foot so in cvt we discussed about the casting technique that is one of the conservative method of treating the congenital vertical talus by dobs technique or reverse ponsetti technique and when we fail then we go for surgical uh, treatment in tarsal coalition also we can try with the conservative management if these patients present with painful foot and after diagnosis by x ray ct scan or mri if we come to know it is a tarsal coalition and patient is having painful foot they can be well treated by cast biloni walking cast and we can extend this casting session as long as the child is painful and gradually we reduce the duration of cast lesser duration of cast and longer duration of cast free period and as this child grow up to the uh, adult and as they cross or reach near the 20 years of age their pain is well under control they don't need any surgery in these patients and in some patients we need to apply some braces or corticosteroid injection in the painful area to relieve them from pain and most of these patients are treated by conservative management only few patients having persistently painful foot they require surgical intervention but all cases do not need surgery there should be in the mind that most of them can be treated by conservative management the mod modalities of conservative management are variety of management uh, we have options like exercises insoles and inserts casting technique and injections if you see that there are variety of exercises but the most important principle and what we are trying to achieve from the exercises it is the strengthening of the muscles strengthening of the muscles which are working in the foot and these muscles intrinsic and extrinsic muscles they basically support our medial longitudinal arch and when this arch is supported by the muscles already we will will be able to recreate the arch or the pressure on the medial aspect of the foot because of flattening of arch will be reduced so there are variety of exercises you can see that two extension exercises by this second is two curls just we are trying to uh, grip the towel with the feet and the role of exercises has been emphasized in the paper by rao and joseph they studied almost around 3000 kids and they found that the kids who were barefooted not using shoes they have a very good uh, arch development compared to the pair, kids who were using shoes continuously and it signifies that exercises of the foot has a role Here you can see that stretching exercises of the uh, muscles of the foot second is to extension then stretching of the tendo achilles because many a times tight tendo achilles leads to flattening of the arch and dynamic stabilization by intrinsic and extrinsic muscle groups leads to gives a support to our medial longitudinal arch and thereby we are able to manage this flat foot patients for tendo achilles stretching and plantar fascia stretching these are the exercises 
Now there is some role of insoles and inserts also in patients who are having painful foot. They are having flat foot, but it is also painful, flexible flat foot with pain or weakness of the uh, muscles. There we can apply insoles and inserts. You can see that by using the insoles, the heel which was going in valgus, medial arch was dropping down. We have just elevated the medial arch and the insoles and the alignment of the foot has become straight. Now the pressure over the medial aspect is reduced. But these insoles, it doesn't treat the, uh, it doesn't recreate the arch permanently. It is only momentary till the arch is there or insole is there. It is recreating the arch, but it doesn't help the arch to reform. So Wenger et al, they found in their study, they divided the patients in four groups and they found that wearing corrective shoes or inserts for three years, it does not influence the course of flexible flat foot. So it gives momentary relief to the foot with pain. It corrects the arch, corrects the foot mechanics, but it doesn't recreate the arch. So in these patients, barefoot walking and playing activity helps in medial longitudinal arch development in the child. This arch develops by five years of age and by 10 years of age, it is fully formed. So before 10 years of age, we should not uh, think of just giving any type of insoles or inserts or special types of shoes. We should give the child some time to develop their own arch. Painful flat foot needs assessment and intervention. We should not discard these patients. This is flexible flat foot. Even if it is flexible flat foot and painful, we should intervene and we should investigate these patients. Flexible painful feet needs insoles and inserts for uh, treatment of pain. These insoles help in momentary correction of flat foot and exercise helps in muscle stretching and strengthening. So we should focus on exercise also. Thank you. Right, Dr. Reno. Thank you. Uh, well, when a patient is brought to you for examination, they are usually accompanied by their parents. Would you prefer to examine their feet also? Yes, sir. Not usually, but uh, sometimes we see that parents are also having flat foot in few of the patients, not always. I, only two or three patients I have examined, not all the patients, but okay. I have found that the father was having flat foot as the child was having. It, it could be any permutation and combination, but I think there is no harm. Only uh, three patients I have seen. If sir. you examine it's the not parents a regular... as well. And number two, uh, the knee joint is one joint which is which must be examined also when you are examining a patient of flat foot and each one of us are aware of it. Uh, you have very rightly highlighted that for tarsal coalitions, the next presentation will deal with it, may not require surgery in all cases. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Now I think uh, we must talk now about the surgical management because that is the due time now. Yeah, most of the orthopedic surgeons are interested in the surgical treatment. So this lecture is very important. So uh, flexible flat foot can be uh, divided into two categories for the understanding the treatment point of view. Uh, the one with a normal length of tendon Achilles where there is no shortening of the tendon Achilles and the treatment of that is already covered really well by the previous speaker. Then we have a condition of a flexible flat foot where the tendo Achilles is short. And then we have a third category which comes into this category where there is a accessory navicular bone. I'm not sure whether what is the relation of accessory navicular bone with the flat foot, but it's always described in this uh, chapter. So the last two conditions uh, usually or sometimes required surgical treatment. I would say sometimes require surgical treatment. On the other end, we have a different variety of flat foot where there is a loss of subtalar movement and which is called a rigid flat foot. There are various reasons for that and Sandeep explained us really well that uh, 
it's a broad category and ultimately there is a loss of subtender movement so all that are grouped into one category that's a rigid flat food so tarsal coalition is one of them the inflammatory conditions or uh, rheumatoid conditions they also produce pain of the subtender joint and patient involuntarily reduce the subtender movement and that's why it's called rigid there is no bony connection between the tarsal bones but because of uh, inflammation there is pain in or painful movement of, of the subtender joint that results into rigid variety of flat foot infection will definitely lead into this category and very rarely tumors will also produce pain and that would produce rigid flat foot all of them they required surgical treatment so no doubt they are small as far as the incidence is concerned but they required surgical treatment now let's come to the first the flexible variety where there is a short tendo achilles it's likely to be painful because why it is likely to be painful that we will see the next but the surgical treatment is tendo achilles lengthening a very simple surgery and i'm sure that everyone sitting in this hall can do it confidently but the important point that when parents come to us for the flat foot they have two components the one is pain the second is appearance the tendo achilles does not take care of the appearance part so we really need to make sure that why they are preferring for surgery or why they are going for surgery and if appearance is one of them then we need to carry out anterior calcaneal lengthening along with tendo achilles lengthening very few of you will be uh, familiar about anterior calcaneal lengthening so i will explain you the concept of that and if required tomorrow we will see the surgical uh, video of that procedure so first of all let us understand that why short tendo achilles leads to pain so uh, this is normal foot now here the tendo achilles is short and when this child is walking uh, with the short tendo achilles ultimately the foot or forefoot comes into contact but over a year this results into a break of the midfoot and that results into the eversion of the subtalar joint so it's a three dimensional deformity but if we look at from the side there is a like this is normal alignment and this results into a break of the telonavicular joint or navicular cuneiform joint and this is where the things go wrong if we look uh, this children from behind we can see the valgus hill and this is how the x ray hind foot view looks like if we look from the top this is normal where we saw that the talus and the first metatarsal are in in the same line but here the another component the three dimensional component is the forefoot is abducted now to understand the procedure that's the lateral column lengthening or moscas procedure or anterior calcaneal lengthening all are same different name to the same procedure to understand that uh, let's see that if we look at this foot model i have divided the tarsal and the metatarsals into two components the fourth and the fifth they are called lateral which are in a blue color and the medial one which are three they are in green color so which column medial or lateral column is long medial column is long good so now if we want to correct the deformity we can either shorten the medial column or we can lengthen the lateral column right so if we see this two finger if they are different height different length either we can lengthen the short one or shorten the long one the procedure which is very popular over here in in the uh, pediatric uh, foot uh, chapter is lengthening the lateral column so we will understand the concept behind that procedure so this is what the foot model which we already see now we carry out a osteotomy at the anterior end of calcaneum which is around 1.5 to 2 cm behind the calcaneum cuboid joint we cut the anterior portion of calcaneum 
Now we are looking at the calcaneum and where we carry out this osteotomy. If we look at the subtalar joint, we remove the talus and then we look at the upper part of the calcaneum, we see a three facet, the anterior facet, medial facet and the lateral facet. And this osteotomy is carried out between the anterior and the medial or the medial facet. This is where the osteotomy is carried out. So it's an intra-articular osteotomy for the subtalar joint. We are looking now from the side and this is where we have cut the calcaneum. Now, understand the principle. After this osteotomy, we pass a wire through the calcaneum joint so that when we open the osteotomy, no displacement takes place at calcaneum cuboid joint. Once we have fixed that, we carry out or we apply a medial force or adduction force. And that results into opening of the osteotomy. Whatever gap has resulted that we put it with the bone graft, either from iliac crest, from fibula, or in cerebral palsy where we have done a distal femur osteotomy, we can use femur also. But usually we prefer iliac crest graft. And then we advance the wire, which is fixing the calcaneum cuboid. Now it fixed the osteotomy. So now if you look at the foot is well corrected. After correcting the foot, we check the length of the calf muscle as described by the Sandeep with the knee extension and with the knee flexion. And we realize which one is short. If it's a gastro only, or both, usually in flat foot, it is calf muscle, both, both uh, soleus and the gastro are short. So we carry out tendoachillis lengthening. So we are not going into that, but that's the full dose of treatment, which we need to give for a flat foot with short tendoachillis. Don't do isolated tendoachillis lengthening because that may take away the patient's pain, but family will be unhappy that the foot is still of the same appearance. Coming to the accessory navicular bone, which requires surgery, which is not really very difficult for any one of us. We make an incision on the prominent navicular and then we excise that navicular, taking out the soft tissue covering. And once we take out the bone like this, we suture the soft tissue coverage. We don't need to carry out a complicated uh, procedures for transferring the tibialis posterior or like that. So uh, these are the like uh, bilateral procedure where we remove the prominent uh, navicular. This is again for two reasons, because it is producing the pain, the pressure pain on the prominent navicular. So we need to carry out that procedure. If there is no pain, there is no need for surgery. And then we coming to the last part that is excision of calcaneo navicular coalition. Uh, Sandeep has shown some pictures, but uh, I will try to explain in some more details so that uh, you get more confidence in uh, dealing with this condition. Again, it's not that difficult. So this is the calcaneo navicular coalition CT scan. We need to take out, sorry, the first of all indication when there is an activity related pain around sinus tarsi area, because with activity, we need a subtalar movement and Navicular and calcaneum cannot move with each other. So it produces more load at other joints and that produces pain around sinus tarsi. Usually we try all the treatment which Dr. Ritesh explained, non-operative treatment. And if we are not getting any relief with this treatment, then it becomes an indication. Just we saw the coalition on the X-ray or CT scan that does not become an indication for this surgery. Sometimes they have a pain on the medial aspect of uh, foot, which is around telonavicular area. The oblique incision over the sinus tarsi, we elevate the extensor digitorum brevis from the sinus tarsi like this, and that will expose the coalition. Once we identify the coalition, we need to define the proximal and distal border, and then we need to use a osteotome, which is of around one centimeter size. And we need to cut at uh, lateral side and like this. 
So we did to check out, all, uh, uh, take out uh, one centimeter of uh, bone from that. So that separates navicular and the calcaneum. This is what the picture of a surgery where we can see the gap, like you can pass a finger and see that it's completely corrected. It's very important that we take out the bone coalition of the full depth. And after putting the finger, either little finger or index finger, depending on the size of finger, we have to ensure that we have corrected the complete coalition. Usually it is of this much size. Once we remove it, we need to cover the raw area with the bone wax because it's a cancerous bone and it's likely to bleed. Then we can fill the gap with either fat, which is taken from the buttock area or from the proximal thigh or suturing the extensor digitorum brevis in the gap. But usually uh, it is better to fill the gap with the fat so that the chances of recurrence are less. And then we give a plaster for uh, soft tissue healing for three to four weeks. So this is what the picture, which shows that uh, this is the coalition. And this is the picture taken at the time of surgery where we can see that there is a complete discontinuity between the navicular and the calcaneum. And this is the post-op picture of the same patient. So the take home message is, there are three common conditions which require surgical treatment in the flat foot variety. And I have tried to make it uh, simple so that uh, you can carry out these procedures with confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dhiren. Well, masters making presentations Things look so easy to perform, but friends, remember, it may not be so. And your clinical examination, your clinical judgment will be so very much important. Uh, Diren, I'm so happy you have done thorough justice, thorough justice to the three procedures that you have described. I am in a way happy that you have not talked about subtalar arthrosis. And when I was entering, I was looking for whether there is a stall keeping an arthrosis implant. So it was not there. Well, in very man many countries, it is so familiar that people know that treatment, surgical treatment in pediatric flat foot is putting an arthrosis implant. Well, there are controversy, but there are good results as well. Your anterior calcaneal osteotomy, you said Mosca's procedure? Yes. Well, talking about calcaneal osteotomies, it is done for even CTEB, even for other purposes. And I would like to mention name of Professor S. Pandey, who uses a T osteotomy for correction of club foot also, and it can be varied for correction of the other deformities. The, this surgery uses only one vertical part of the T, and you have nicely demonstrated how it can be contemplated. Uh, well, I, what uh, I would like to know from you, Calcaneal osteotomy behind also is one procedure which is widely practiced. Uh, any reason, time, because of paucity of time, you no, did? Tomorrow, like, we have a session on surgical deformity correction. All right. And in that, I have covered all the remaining osteotomies. Yes. Ma so it is still in your kitty. Thank you. John. So, yeah, so uh, what about... Uh, uh, Telocalcaneal coalition. coalition. Yeah. Yeah, fine. I have not covered that because it's very rare. It's very difficult to tackle surgically. So I have not. not, not uh, okay. Yeah, but usually you end up with fusing the joint if it's painful. Yeah. yeah. The, the older like, ones. Uh, looking to the audience, if it's a pediatric orthopedic conference, I would have covered that. But here I want to uh, cover only those things which is common and which a general orthopedic surgeon can do it confidently. That's why I have not covered it. 
Okay. But we do see it often. Uh, I, I, I've seen. Uh, I have diagnosed, but when, yeah. when it comes to treatment, very few patients have turned up for surgical. True. I mean, actually, the word subtalar fusion, it is very difficult to get about the CT scan also because we need to get about CT in that oblique plane. So it is like a very commonly it will be missed or underdiagnosed. And we need to do about the how much is that mapping, then we can decide either, but most of them will end up in the complete fusion or. Now we will have discussion on last three lectures. Or maybe we we'll skip yeah. discussion. Okay. 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 Then, then case based discussion by Dr. Shodha Chodhi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I thank uh, John Sir and uh, Jaswinder for inviting me here. I have uh, two cases to present. The first case is a 13 year old male who has uh, activity related pain on the medial side of the midfoot for two, three years. And he has some issues with uh, footwear also. He has bilateral pain and left is worse. And there is a history of frequent falls while playing. Uh, clinically, the subtalar joint is practically quite stiff. Talonavicular movements are severely re reduced and uh, tendo Achilles appears to be contracted. These are the clinical pictures. As we can see from the backside, the heel is in valgus. On a single leg stance, there is a fall in the arch and there is a quite prominent telonavicular joint over there. And in the front also, the foot looks flat with prominent telonavicular joint. These are his x-rays. Anybody can, anybody would like to comment? Are they weight bearing? No, they are not. So I think I weight bearing is a... yeah, weight bearing is better. This case was so there is a coalition uh, in the calcaneal navicular. Yes, so there is a calcaneal navicular coalition, and there are degenerative changes in the talonavicular area also. Probably that is the reason he is having. Exactly, osteophytes on the navicular as well as on the dorsal side of the talus. So what are the options in this case? Anybody would like to opt for a conservative management for this case? Trial of conservative. He, has, been, uh, he has had uh, therapy and some inserts for three years. And, uh, is Just not... below knee cast application for six weeks. Uh, do you, I mean, uh, with all these osteophytes and such restricted motion as well as TN changes, what As I said, it? you know, I'm not sure whether they are osteophytes. I mean, it's very rare to get true degenerative osteophytes in a adolescent boy. These, these are actually spurs which occur due to, you know, excess strain on the talonavicular joint and they occur on the tailor neck. I mean, they are more of an extra articular, you know, they are due to stripping of the periosteum at the level of the tailor neck. So they should not be, you know, uh, assumed to be indicators of osteoarthritis. The joint space looks quite okay. So I don't think this is osteoarthritis, but definitely, I mean, this requires treatment. Uh, yeah, so. Your concern tell me. is that the child has repeated falls. Repeated falls also, right from the beginning? Yes. Apart from the pain. Last two three years, he has had constant pain and he has seen multiple doctors and he, they have all advised insoles, which is of no help. So at this age, what is the cause of recurrent falls? Not at this age. He has been having it okay. right from the early childhood. Okay, so is what is. I have a CT. No, no, there is no other coalition. I have not put the CT here. But. When we have one that does not mean that there are no other conditions. Always we need to go for CT scan. Yes, yes. Uh, all right. Okay. So for a 13 year old child and who has been having symptoms for three years and who has had all the orthotic treatments. In cases, we need to go for a Biloni cast. Okay. So, there is an element of muscle imbalance and some muscle rebalancing may have to be required. Where is the pain? 
मीडियल साइड ऑफ द फेस Yes, in fact, he has some amount of ankle laxity. So, if he stands on uh, his heels up, you can see some amount of inversion. Probably that is happening at the ankle. So, uh, again, I went on uh, went on with the surgical treatment. I removed the uh, coalition part, and then I did a. After that, I could see that the talonavicular joint is still mobile. So, I could move the uh, medial arch. and i thought appearance wise also we should add some other procedure so i did a calcaneal lengthening and grafted it with locally harvested fibula those wires are for retraction and actually when you do this lengthening osteotomy you have to pass a wire across the cuboid into the front part of the calcaneum before you distract because then the joint will not sublux and then you pass it across the graft into the proximal calcaneum and this is the again this is not a weight bearing x ray this is very early actually in the follow up this is just uh, 10 months now and uh, then he has gone to delhi for his studies and uh, so these abrasions are because of the some playing uh, incident so these are the what he has sent on whatsapp to me recently so some reasonably looking arch and uh, he is able to do all his activities these are the pre and post laterals so there has to be uh, there appears to be some improvement in the talocalcaneal and calcaneal pitch also as well as the talo personal tarsal angles overall par parents and patient is satisfied with the procedure so i would just like to know any comments pain is fine, pain is fine. Honestly, you actually Uh, it was about one and a half centimeters of fibula. Uh, this thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, Post-op X-ray is not uh, oblique, so it, that length will not be properly visible in that. Yes, that is the fibula there. Only I would ask the other other faculty. You know, what are the indications for deformity correction along with uh, your bar excision? and would you do it at the same stage or uh, would you stage it a little later yeah very good question sandeep i have done that mistake of doing uh, both the things together in one stage and uh, it has been mentioned in the textbook uh, fortunately i did not had any complication or like he did not have any complication but uh, the literature says that please don't combine both the procedures because soft tissue healing is not uh, really good in this area so i was just going to point that you are really lucky that there was no healing or in my case also i was lucky but ideally we should not combine both the things together sir uh, dr moska he shows to be combining both of them actually in one so when one go so that's where you have to be very careful as to where the pain is localized now in his case he was a calcaneal navicular collision if the pain was because of the collision you know excision of collision would have been fine but in his case i feel the pain was on the talonavicular joint which indicates that the pain was also because of you know stress on the talonavicular joint which is due to the flat foot deformity and therefore in his case the flat foot deformity correction is indicated the only question is whether it should be done at the same sitting or at a later sitting what do you think what what is your opinion yeah, i would probably do it at the same sitting because you know it is difficult in our setup to you know get the patient to come back and uh, yeah the other thing and is if the pain doesn't get relieved after your par excision you know they are going to be on a to say the reason for doing it in one stage is that it's difficult to get the patient to come back doesn't get relieved, <laughs> they are going to be unhappy so can we do only anterior calcaneal lengthening because their pain is located at the medial side not at the anterior lateral at the no but the stress at the talonavicular joint will remain then if you don't restore the mobility but this move is will not move and it will not move unless you separate the calcaneal and navicular stress will remain there no no so there won't be any motion not no uh, other thing is uh, dr Ma hello Dr. Moska has all all always said that combining this with a cuneiform osteotomy. That is what I was asking. So because uh, the supinated to pro Moska osteotomy. Okay, you are talking about the uh, four foot. Flexion. 
Also so to correct it simultaneously because of the wriggling pattern of the foot, one deformity goes into supination of valgus, the other goes into pronation. So, so, so that is that is the last decision to be taken after this osteotomy. Yeah. Some cases the forefoot or the medial column will actually be flexible. In those cases, you don't have to add it simultaneously. We're talking about a fixed, uh, yeah. Uh, second case is of another 12 year old male who had a medial midfoot pain again, and he had prominent footwear issues. Uh, he, his feet used to hurt when the shoes, and uh, there is a prominence of teller head and uh, restricted ankle movements and subtellar movements. These are the clinical pictures. This is only on the right side. Uh, you can see that the uh, teller head is quite prominent here. And on uh, standing on tiptoes, there appears to be some amount of uh, inversion occurring there. These are his x-rays, again, non-weight bearing. Uh, this was referred to me and I didn't ask for uh, weight bearing x-ray because I straight away went for the CT. So, tell us is... Uh, so, like, we, we need the better imaging because we are not able to understand the pathology clearly. Exactly. So, uh, probably the CT will be able to show it better because even in lateral, this lateral is taken adequately. It's not weight bearing, but it's difficult to visualize the teller neck and where the navicular is sitting. So, uh, on the CT, there seems to be a small coalition over there. And uh, these are the 3D images. There is a small coalition between the talus and the calcaneum on the posterior side, posterior medial side, as well as there is a complete dislocation of the navicular. Navicular is sitting on the neck of the talus. So it's a, <laughs> it's a combination of CVT and... Uh, it's painful. Pain is mostly at the TN actually. Medial side, predominantly the navicular, talonavicular area. Yes. Yes. That is the area where it's happening. So, in the middle image, actually, you can see that talar dome is totally uncovered. It is lying in the front and the head is entirely down. So, again, options. Anybody would like to offer conservative to LBS? Triple probably is. Because another point that is to be considered is the quality of cartilage in the subtalar joint, which yes. in this case is likely to be poor. Very poor. So there is no point in excising that bar and attempt to get any motion at the subtalar joint. Um, yeah, is gone. yeah. So, okay. Any other differing opinion? Uh, what is the age of the patient? 12? 12 years old. Uh, I would like maybe to wait for some few more years for the skeleton to mature and would prefer going for a different kind of pan tailor arthrodesis in which uh, this is. Yes. Ankle as well, yes, because of the advantage that you take out the talus as a whole. This is a classical paper from Professor Sureshwar Pandey, and he removes the talus and removes the articular cartilage all around and puts it back uh, into the corrected position. And when they unite, it's a good plantigrade foot and definitely is painless. So something like a morsalization? Oh, yes. But he does that in younger patients? Uh, younger patients as well. And you see the midfoot also. Because it's not only the finger. So it's a borrowing of the midfoot. You can see that the tarsometer tarsal joints are also aligned. Tarsometer tarsal joints are reasonably aligned. If you... Oh, lateral view. Hmm. So it's a dysplasia over in that area and it has remained all throughout so the morphology is different. <laughs> so
So I did a navicular excision and uh, reconstruction with a dual incision. I released the tibialis posterior, lengthening of uh, tendo achilles, peroneus brevis, tibialis anterior, and uh, certain capsular releases, especially the posterior ankle release because the talus wasn't uh, going up into the ankle properly. Navicular was excised. Uh, Talonavicular, talocalcaneal coalition was removed. I was not intending to do that. I was intending to do a naviculectomy and correction. And then the talus could go and align with the cuneiform. And as that happened, probably the space was created under the talus, so the even the heel uh, inverted and uh, calcaneum came down. And uh, since the talocalcaneal joint was of uh, very poor cartilage was there, so I opted for a fusion. Whatever navicular I had removed, I decancel it, and removed the cartilage, and I put it back into the uh, talocalcaneal space. And Timpos what was advanced to cuneiform, and uh, KYS were applied to put the hold up position. So I have preserved the tallow uh, navicular, yes. Pardon me? It's not a triple. I have not done a triple. I have treated it as a neglected case of a, a neglected case of CVT where navicularectomy is uh, the advised treatment along with the soft tissue uh, reconstruction. And in the process of doing that, the coalition broke off. Yes. So, so whatever, whatever little movement he has, I have another option of going back and fusing it later, if at all. So a triple uh, would remain painless for how long? Like even that time, that also will degenerate over a period of time. Yes. Yes. So navicular wasn't in a good position to begin with, sir. It was not articulating with anything relevant. So, so fusing the talus with the cuneiforms. Navicular is out. There is no. Oh. There is no space where the navicular will remain, if at all. I, I mean, navicularectomy is a standard treatment for CVT in a 12 year old. There is no way that the navicular will go back. So, create a, a space, maybe initial just could have been helpful prior to your surgical exercise. Uh, sir, the cartilage hasn't been articulating well. The navicular is articulating with the telar neck for all these years. So even creating the space what and putting the it there, the, the cartilage was bad, quite bad. And, and the cuneiform? cuneiform cartilage was still okay, but it was not. Uh, it was misshapen. It was not in with a misshapen cuneiform, but cartilage is okay. And probably I'm saving that joint for another six, seven years, maybe. One point that you have made it very clear that. Tibialis posterior is the dynamic uh, muscle force which you have transposi transposition yes. to the cuboid, right? Mm -hmm. So this one requires certain sometimes. So these were the intraop images. Uh, this is how the foot looked at the end of the procedure. Again, this was done just last uh, ten days back, so I don't have the long term follow up. These are his comparative images and the post-op angles look to be better. Just very early days. So I think which spoils the surgery like a long follow-up. <laughs>
Thank you. So we'll just have a video session in this only. This session only we have a small video. Dr. Sandeep is playing that. Hello friends. In this video, we discuss the surgical technique of the triple C osteotomy. The triple C osteotomy is a combined calcaneum, cuboid, and medial cuneiform osteotomy described by Mubarak and Rajan for correction of plano valgus deformities of the foot in children. The indication for this surgery is a flat foot, which remains persistently painful despite an adequate trial of conservative treatment. In this video, we discuss the surgery being performed on a 15 year old male with painful flexible flat foot and tight tendo achilles. The child is experiencing pain along the medial border of the foot under the plantar flex Taylor head. Pre-operative weight bearing radiographs of the foot show all the radiographic parameters of flat foot. The first part of the osteotomy is the posterior calcaneum displacement osteotomy. This is a pure translational osteotomy in which the heel axis is aligned with the tibiotalar axis by translation of the distal heel fragment. An oblique incision is made posterior to the lateral malleolus. The peroneal tendons are retracted anteriorly. The periosteum is incised and elevated and the incision is deepened down to bone. Homan retractors are placed on the dorsal and plantar surface of the calcaneal tuberosity. The osteotomy commences at a point one centimeter behind the posterior limit of the subtalar joint. From here, the osteotomy extends obliquely at an angle of 45 degrees towards the plantar surface of the calcaneum. In the horizontal plane, the osteotomy is parallel to the plantar surface of the calcaneum. The osteotomy is performed initially with a saw and then completed with an osteotomy. Care is taken to avoid injury to the posterior neurovascular bundle, which lies on the medial side. The periosteum on the medial surface of the calcaneum is stripped in order to adequately mobilize the distal heel fragment. Following this, the distal heel fragment is translated laterally by about one centimeter. This realigns the heel fragment uh, axis with the tibiotalar axis. The second part of the osteotomy is the cuboid lateral open wedge osteotomy. Incision for this osteotomy is made transversely overlying the cuboid. The extensor digitorum brevis origin is elevated. Homan retractors are placed on the dorsal and plantar surfaces of the cuboid. Osteotomy is made in the mid portion of the cuboid parallel to the calcaneo cuboid joint. The osteotomy is opened laterally by inserting a lamina spreader. The third part of the osteotomy is the medial cuneiform plantar close wedge osteotomy. To perform this osteotomy, a transverse incision is made overlying the medial cuneiform. The tibialis anterior is retracted dorsally and Homan retractors are placed on the dorsal and plantar surface of the medial cuneiform. A plantar a based wedge is then removed from the body of the medial cuneiform. The medial cuneiform osteotomy is then closed and fixed with a K wire. The wedge obtained from the medial cuneiform is then inserted into the cuboid osteotomy. The wedge is then inserted into place by hammering with a punch and hammer. The calcaneum and cuboid osteotomies are fixed with K wires. If there is an associated gastrosoleus tightness, it should be addressed by performing the appropriate muscle lengthening procedure. Post operatively, a below knee slab is applied, which is then changed to a cast 
at the first post operative dressing the casts and wires are continued for a period of 6 weeks following which they are removed following cast removal the child is kept non weight bearing for further 4 weeks and afos are applied at follow up serial x rays are made which confirm good radiological and cl uh, and clinical correction of the deformity studies have shown good clinical and radiological outcomes with the triple c osteotomy to conclude the triple c osteotomy gives gives good radiological and functional outcomes with results comparable to those in literature thank you so any more questions before we finish Sandeep, this uh, i would only like to know when you will like to limit yourself to the calcaneal osteotomy alone if ever so these adolescent children they already have established bony deformities in which there is you know associated abduction of the forefoot as well and in these cases i think you know i would do the complete triple c osteotomy there are some cases you know like you know uh, uh, the isolated posterior calcaneal displacement osteotomy it is described in younger children in cases of heel valgus seen in spina bifida but apart from that you know the older children probably i would go for the triple c osteotomy just before i we move ahead one more point i would like to just mention over here that there is a criticism regarding the triple c osteotomy that it doesn't correct the actual talonavicular uh, you know uncoverage at the level of the talonavicular joint it just you know creates deformities proximal and distal to compensate for the deformity of the talonavicular joint so that is one criticism which moshka always does you know and he you know propagates his osteotomy but the problem that we have seen sometimes with the moshka's osteotomy is that on long term follow up there is some collapse of the arch that again happens we do lose some correction which we have attended the primary surgery yeah clo also in the same setting if it is yes means uh, it's my observation that closing the uh, plantar based wedge in the medial cuneiform uh, is slightly difficult means uh, comparatively the osteotomy in the first metatarsal base is more easy to close means what is your experience about it Yeah, so first metatarsal osteotomy is not recommended for one one reason is you know there is a physis at the base of the first metatarsal and uh, secondly there is some concern that that leads to you know transfer metatarsal here to the more lateral toes that has also been reported uh, especially moshka so uh, uh, so moshka does uh, you know describe these medial cuneiform osteotomies in certain situations but then he warns against doing a first metacarpal osteotomy so i think and it is a quite a broad bone this it can be easily done yes yes it gets closed no problem so you do your lateral uh, cuboid osteotomy as well and then try to close it will be easier to close then if you try to close it without doing the cuboid osteotomy it will be difficult to close so if there are no more questions we come to the end of this session may i request dr ritesh runu sir to felicitate our chairperson dr s s jha sir ritesh runu sir please thank you sir dr jibendu sir dr jibendu sir dr dk sinha sir and dr vikas thank you chair persons so we are moving to the last session of uh, today's cme and may i invite invite dr arvind gupta to moderate this session
So uh, uh, this is session four, uh, that is neuromuscular disorder. May I request Dr. Subhas Chandra sir to please come on the uh, Dr. Janki Saran Badani and Dr. Ritesh Renu sir, uh, kindly chair the session. Thank you. Can and also join the chair, sir. Dr. Sar Dr. Saurabh Chaudhary, please come on the dice. Yeah, good evening. Hello, good evening, everybody. Now we are going to start a neuromuscular session. And the first talk will be by Dhiren Ganjwala, sir. He'll be talking about a spastic foot and ankle in cerebral palsy. We see a lot of children coming to us for our opinion. And many of them are walking with equinus and we have a temptation to carry out a surgical treatment. Fine, we are surgeons and naturally, if we have a desire and the keen interest in surgery, that's always good. I want to convey one important point in this presentation. We all know that spasticity is exaggerated velocity dependent stretch reflex, means when we stretch the muscle rapidly, it causes or it goes into contraction. That is what the spasticity is. So there are various spastic foot deformities. The most common one is equinus. The second one is varus, where the forefoot and the hind foot, they go in varus or a valgus deformity. And very rarely we have calcaneus. In the remaining presentation, I'm going to focus only on equinus deformity. Equinus deformities are of two types. The one is we call it functional or a dynamic. Means when child is relaxed, when child is lying down on an examination table and we look at the ankle joint range of motion, there is a normal ankle range of motion. But the same child when is upright, standing or walking, there is an exaggerated tone in the calf muscles and that results into equinus deformity. So that's our dynamic deformity. The important point, please don't carry out surgical treatment in dynamic variety. Then there is a second group where even when they are relaxed, when they are comfortable in a lying down position or even slipping, if you look at the range of motion of the ankle joint, the ankle does not dorsiflex fully means now there is a contracture of a calf muscle. And yes, they are the candidates for surgical treatment. So now the problem of equinus, the first of all, why we really need to treat equinus. Basically, when child is walking with equinus, the child is walking on only the forefoot. And that creates a very small base of support. Already these children have a balance problem. The cerebral palsy children have a balance problem. And if they walk with equinus, Hitesh, uh, then it reduces the base of support and makes a child difficult for walking. The second, when they walk only on the forefoot, the whole body weight comes on the forefoot and that results into broadening of the foot. The heel remains small and the forefoot become thick and broad. It leads to midfoot break. We will see that when the child constantly walk with equinus, ultimately the body tries to have a heel contact and that results into a midfoot break deformity. Occasionally that leads to recurvatum at the knee joint. And if it's a unilateral case like a hemiplegic cerebral palsy, then the foot which is or the ankle which is in equinus will have a functional longer length and that leads to limb length discrepancy. So the long-term effect of spasticity is ultimately it results into muscle contracture. So initially the child only have a functional variety or a dynamic variety, but over a year, it, uh, years, it becomes a contracture. Non-operative management options to us are 
a stretching exercise which we recommend uh, to carry out with physiotherapy or even at home we can give them orthosis which restricts plantar flexion and allow the child to walk in a plantigrade position we can give a stretching brace which they apply at night so that when they are sleeping the calf muscle is stretched or we can give them a cast or the last option which is before few years was very popular that was a botulinum injection but now that has gone out of fashion so stretching exercise are basically that uh, ultimately we the parents have a very limited time and the major constraint of that is time because they cannot carry out exercise for eight hours in a day that is what some people say or the some references that if you stretch the muscles eight hours a day then you can prevent it becoming a contracture but no one in this busy life has eight hours with them for exercise so this is a, another option the stretching splint so it's a above knee splint which has a very flexible portion at the heel and we have a strap to take the foot into dorsiflexion so these straps when tightened it takes the foot into dorsiflexion and the mechanism can be seen this is the red one is a calf muscle we need to go below sorry above the knee joint because calf has a component gastro and it originates from the above the knee so we need to if we effectively want to stretch gastrocnemius then we have to use above knee splint so this is green is a splint it keeps the foot in this position and then with the stretch uh, with the steps it takes the foot portion into dorsiflexion and then it gives a stretch to the calf muscle which usually child uses at night time so they have 6 to 8 hours of stretching my experience is that if the splint is effectively working the child will not use this brace for more than 2 hours at night they will get up and then they will uh, cry and tell the parents that please remove it but that tells us that yes this splint is working for those who are not following the uh, suggestions the stretching plaster is one option under anesthesia we stretch the calf and then we give a plaster keep it for 3 to 4 weeks it's very effective treatment the only negative point is that because we are immobilizing the ankle joint it will create wasting of the calf muscles already in cerebral palsy the muscles are weak and we increase the weakness botulinum neurotoxin is a locally acting treatment it's a locally acting paralyzing agent to understand the mechanism of action this is a neuromuscular junction the upper one is a nerve fiber and the lower one the striated skeletal muscle and the blue one is a neuromuscular junction when the signals comes like this the vesicles which contains acetylcholine are released in the neuromuscular junction and that causes the muscle to contract now when we give botulinum injection it spreads it's given in the calf muscle it spreads to the neuromuscular junction sorry it to the nerve terminal and look at this is the neuromuscular jun junction membrane which is fenestrated chemically it is converted with the injection into a impermeable membrane so now acetylcholine cannot enter into the neuromuscular junction and because there is no acetylcholine the skeletal muscle will not contract and we can say that it's paralyzed so what happens now with the now uh, now signals the acetylcholine vesicles will not enter into the neuromuscular junction and it will not cause contraction of the muscles this treatment once very popular but due to variety of side effects now it is going out of fashion so we are not discussing more about that but let me tell you in spite of the best treatment all the treatment which we discussed ultimately over a period of time the contracture develops and at that particular point the child requires surgical treatment now i am sure that the surgery is very easy the only point which we need to remember that i will clarify so looking at this 
leg and uh, foot, we have uh, two muscles. The one is soleus. The second one is gastro. The difference between the two is soleus is originating below the ankle joint, while the gastro originates above the knee joint. Sorry, knee joint. And then both these muscles have a common tendon, which we call it tendo Achilles. Tendo Achilles is a very popular surgery. And everyone can do it easily in 15 minutes time. Not, not a problem at all. So when we do a tendo Achilles surgery, Z lengthening, we cut the tendon in a Z manner. And once we cut the proximal and the distal portion of the tendon will become separate and we will be able to correct the equinus or the ankle deformity. That will restore the length of the calf muscles. The point which I would like you to remember, everyone in this hall, please remember that, please don't carry out tendo Achilles surgery in a diaplegic children. Why? I will explain that. We saw that uh, there are two muscles which are very close by. One is soleus, the muscles originating below the knee joint and the gastro. Now in diaplegics, means when both the lower limbs are affected, they have more problem in the gastro muscles, which is a bi-articular muscles. So that I have shown as a red. Their soleus is normal, which is I have shown in a green. Now, when we carry out a Z lengthening of tendo Achilles in these patients, what happens? It will lengthen both. It will lengthen gastro as well as it will lengthen soleus. So what will happen after surgery? Look at this picture and this one. Now the gastro length is restored. What happened to soleus? Soleus was normal to begin with. Now after surgery, what will happen to soleus? Over lengthen. Yes, that's the main problem. That soleus, which was normal by tendo Achilles, will become over length. And tendo Achilles lengthening leads to unwanted lengthening of soleus muscle. And that is a reason because soleus is one of the muscle which helps us to remain upright. We are remaining upright because of the soleus is pulling the tibia from behind and keeping the tibia vertical and that's why we are upright. As soon as that function is lost, the child like this, the tibia will go anterior and once it will go anteriorly, the knee will back and that results into a crouch gait. So, that is a reason tendo Achilles lengthening should be avoided in diplegics. So which is a surgery which we need to carry out? We need to carry out a surgery which is called a Stryer's procedure or a selective lengthening of the gastrocnemius muscle. How we do that we will see in a video later on, but we create a plane between the gastro and soleus. And then we cut only the gastro. And this will lengthen the gastrocnemius, will not do anything to the soleus. So now with this procedure, both gastro and soleus are of normal length. So selective lengthening of gastrocnemius is a preferred option in diaplegic. So the take home message is spastic equinus is a very common deformity. Known operative treatment, which we discuss, should be used first. But once the contracture develop, then surgical treatment is required. And in that, please avoid tendoachylis lengthening in diaplegics. For them, the selective lengthening of gastrocnemius is a preferred technique. So that's the most important message. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such a nice uh, description. Uh, sir, one thing I wanted to ask uh, that uh, about... Yeah, please, there is an entity known as a false equinus. Many a times a patient coming with equinus, but it is not a true equinus in cases of hamstring contracts. Okay, so that's come in the decision making that it looks like an equinus, but actually the problem is that the 
knee does not extend fully in the terminal string. And instead of full knee extension, it remains like this. Yes. And when it does not extend fully, the child will end up with the forefoot content. And many surgeons, particularly those who are not doing a cerebral palsy surgery routinely, they will take this as a apparent requirement. And yes, if you do uh, any surgery, desktop or temporary surgery in apparent requirements, you are creating a more process in the child. Yes, so that's a very important message that avoid any surgery in, on the calf on, on apparent requirements patients. They need a uh, hamstring injury. Thank you, sir. And uh, one more question, sir. In cases of inhibition cast or stretching cast, we are applying. For how long that cast should be there? And should yeah. we add any muscle relaxant with the casting or not? Yeah. Usually, if we want to get a good result, then we need to change cast at every week. So, but then it becomes too expensive for that. So, usually the practice is you give first cast under anesthesia, keep it for three weeks, allow the child to walk. But still, uh, the reason of walking is like it maintains the bone health. But the atrophy part will be there. We can definitely add a muscle relaxant, something like baclofen or a diazepam to that to get additional effect. Yeah, we can combine that medicine. I think we have a discussion session at the end of the three talks, so let's just keep it there. Okay, so I'm going to cover uh, paralytic disorders of the foot and ankle in which uh, mainly spina bifida and polio I'm going to cover. But remember that paralytic disorders, uh, so spina bifida obviously uh, is affection, uh, spinal dysraphism, affection of the spinal cord. Uh, poliomyelitis, it is the anterior horn cells of the, uh, of the, again, in the spinal cord. But then paralytic disorders can also occur as a sequela of, uh, you know, transverse myelitis, that is Guillain-Barré syndrome. So that is at the spinal cord level. At the nerve level, you can have various neuropathies in which, you know, Charcot-Marie tooth is there. Then you can have traumatic nerve injuries, common peroneal nerve palsy. And at the muscle level, again, you can have muscular dystrophy. So all these conditions, uh, you know, uh, paralytic disorders encompasses all these conditions. But the principles of management remain the same. You know, you have to see which muscles are paralyzed. What is the effect of that muscle paralysis? What deformity it is creating? And you have to treat them accordingly. So let's start off first with, you know, spina bifida. And in uh, spinal dysraphism, you know, these are the various foot and ankle problems that you can see. Generally, the congenital problems that you can see, they are CTV and CVT. Uh, congenital problems are CTV and CVT. And the rest of the problems that I've mentioned, pes valgus, pes calcaneus, uh, equinus, cavus cavovirus, these are all acquired problems. And additionally, in spina bifida, you must be aware that a major problem that you face is neuropathic skin ulceration. This is, this is because these children have insensate skin. Some of the principles I will just highlight before we go ahead with the each of the deformities. One is the aim of treatment is a plantigrade braceable foot with preservation of range of motion. The aim is not to achieve a normal foot with normal range of, uh, with normal neurological power. That is not possible. So the counseling has to be accordingly. Uh, for the deformities, you have to start off with casting, bracing, and in cases where it is needed, you will have to do soft tissue releases and bony osteotomies wherever necessary. So that's for the deformities. Additionally, these children have muscle imbalances, and therefore to correct that, you require a muscle rebalancing procedures that is tendon transfers as appropriate. Arthrodesis must be, and this is one of the most important point, arthrodesis, you must try to avoid strictly in this group of patients because they have insensate skin. And if you combine this insensate skin with stiffness, that's a recipe for pressure source. And post-op bracing is vital to maintain correction. So see that these are some of the treatment principles. So let's look at each of the deformities. Uh, spinal dysraphism, uh, CTV. So CTV is quite common. And the higher your lesion, the higher your meningomyelocele lesion, the higher your incidence of CTV. So in a thoracic lesion, you would see almost a 90% you know, incidence of CTV, whereas in a sacral lesion, the incidence drops down. And the thing about these are, these are teratologic deformities, so they are very rigid. These have been present throughout the intrauterine life, 
and there has been no fetal kinesia because of the muscle paralysis and therefore these are tend to be very rigid deformities and they are associated with internal tibial torsion now initially it was assumed that all meningomyelocele ctvs should go for surgical correction but papers which have come out in the last decade have shown that ponsetti method is successful in this group of patients however there are a few key differences number one you have to be extremely careful while application of cast while giving the cast padding and while molding of the cast because otherwise you can land up with skin breakdown that is very common in this group of patients higher number of cast will be needed the 70 degree external rotation which you you know acquire with the ponsetti casting in case of you know non idiopathic club foot that is not possible in this group of patients here you may have to you know uh, reach maybe 0 or 10 20 degree of external rotation and if you are not getting any further correction then you have to go ahead with the tenotomy and of course the relapse rate is going to be very very high as high as 70% surgical treatment is needed for resistant cases or relapses now what are the surgeries that surgeries that you do in these cases again depends on what is the residual deformity so if it's a complete full flesh deformity you would have to do the, your extensive posterior medial plus posterior lateral release which is done through the cincinnati incision and the important thing over here the difference between this and your uh, release that you do in non idiopathic conditions is that the tendons are excised rather than lengthened rather remember that in you know especially the high lumbar and thoracic lesions these are anyways paralyzed tendons and if you leave them you just lengthen them then they can lead to recurrence so better is just excise them if the child is a bit older and the bony deformities have already set in you have to go for osteotomies the osteotomies again uh, should as far as possible be joint sparing osteotomies so for lateral column shortening you can do excision arthrodesis of the calcaneum cuboid joint that is evans procedure or excision of anterior process of calcaneum or shortening osteotomy of the calcaneum and medial column lengthening you can do with the uh, uh, medial cuneiform open wedge osteotomy salvage telectomy has been described in this group of patients okay then coming to the equinus deformity again this is seen in thoracic and high lumbar lesions and uh, again you have to try start off with conservative management casting and bracing if that fails you have to go ahead with uh, in mild cases with ta excision in severe cases you will have to do excision of all tendons plus capsulotomies and release of the calcaneo fibular ligament cvt uh, the incidence is, is a bit lesser than uh, ctv 10% according to sharard's uh, study uh initial treatment again is with dobs with reverse ponsetti but the chances of failure are very high nevertheless you should apply a few casts because the assumption is that it would make the deform uh, the uh, deformity a bit supple which would make your surgical release a bit less extensive surgery i think you know it has already been covered in the last talk the principles of surgery again remain the same it's a complete dorsal and posterior soft tissue release with open reduction pinning of the talonavicular joint but here again if your dorsal tendons are paralyzed you may choose to excise them and here you should transfer the tibialis anterior to the talar neck because it would provide a tenodizing effect and prevent that talus from again sagging down calcaneus is a you know a curious deformity which occurs in meningomyelocele patients seen in about 10% cases it occurs in l4 l5 lesions where you have strong ankle dorsiflexors but weak plantar flexors and the problem with this calcaneus deformity is that uh, it uh, it is a predisposing factor for pressure soles of the heel very flexible deformities you may you know try out with a force but most of these cases they require surgical correction initial surgical correction may just be with a soft tissue release uh, so uh, an anterior lateral soft tissue release would be done a uh, p body transfer that is tibial tibialis anterior transfer to os calcis has been described in this condition but the results are varied in literature some authors they uh, proclaim a good result whereas others don't in older children where the calcaneum is already deformed you would have to do a calcaneum displacement osteotomy so again start off with the soft tissue procedures they fail go ahead with the bony procedures valgus it is common in ambulatory children here it is very important to differentiate between hind foot valgus and ankle valgus because both of them can occur in a child with spina bifida it is important to differentiate between the two because the treatment differs so in case of an ankle valgus if the child is young you would put a medial malleolus screw because you know that would uh, 
kind of create a hemi epiphytodesis a growth modulation and will help to correct the deformity whereas in adolescence you will have to do a bony osteotomy that is the supramalar osteotomy uh if it is a hind foot valgus then you would have to do the posterior calcaneum displacement osteotomy that is the osteotomy which i described as a part of the triple c osteotomy so that you would do over here in case of in case the valgus is arising at the level of the subtalar joint last we come to the neuropathic ulcers and that's a real big problem and that occurs if you have an insensate skin and you have deformities and plus your afos are not fitting well so in this group of patients you have to be very careful when you prescribe the afos the afos are have to be very well padded you have to make sure that there are no pressure areas now if a child comes in with a pressure sore and there is an underlying infection or osteomyelitis the first stage would be taking care of that infection which would involve debridement and antibiotics once the infection heals uh what you would have to essentially do to make that ulcer to heal uh is you will have to offload that area completely because these children are insensate they would tend to you know hurt that area repeatedly which would lead to non healing ulcer so what the best way to do that is apply a cast and create a window within that cast so that you can do the uh, wound dressing and then once the wound completely heals you have to go ahead with the deformity correction so that the uh, uh, ulcer does not recur so this is an example this was a child who had a club foot and who had who was walking on the lateral border of the foot developed this ulcer to start with we applied this cast we created a window in the cast and as you after you know a few dressings the wound healed up and after the wound healed then we proceeded with deformity correction so that should be your sequence for if there is an infection first cure the infection offload the area by applying the cast let the ulcer heal and then go ahead with deformity correction finally i will just take one minute over here so foot and ankle in paralytic disorders a polio uh, we don't see much of polio here yet i am going to touch upon this because it is not polio per se but you know any paralytic disorder the principles are the same again you have to see there is a muscle imbalance there is a defor because of the muscle imbalance there is a deformity and along with the deformity in polio the problem is there is can also be joint instability so these all these problems have to be solved in order to get a better outcome so if there is a muscle imbalance how will you solve that you would have to do tendon transfers to restore the muscle imbalance deformity again the same principles for soft tissue releases or joint sparing osteotomies and if there is a joint uh, instability you would have to do arthrodesis so in polio triple arthrodesis is performed quite commonly for joint instability unlike in uh, because polio is a pure motor paralysis unlike in spina bifida where you have you know sensory problems as well now this is an article which i would recommend all of you to read hitesh is a co-author in this article beautifully written article it is in fact in two parts i am only quoting the second part over here and there is a section over here on paralytic disorders and this illustration that is there is a very you know simple illustration but it helps you in planning your tendon transfers beautifully so what this this shows of transverse section of the foot these are the tendons on the dorsum of the foot these are the tendons on the posterior aspect now this line that is there all the muscles which are there anterior to a a uh, a line these are dorsiflexors of the foot muscles on the posterior side these are plantar flexors and this is the line this is the axis of the subtalar joint so all the muscles on the medial side are inverters all the muscles on the outer side are everters now how does this illustration help us to plan our tendon transfer so here is an example tbl is anterior is paralyzed over here right so you mark that with a white what does that indicate so what deformities would it cause it would cause a first metatarsal drop it would cause a medial column caves it would cause a forearm pronation and what are the muscle imbalances so you can see that a dorsiflexor and an inverter are paralyzed so plantar flexors are stronger than dorsiflexors and everters are stronger than inverters which tendon transfer would solve this problem so if you transfer your peroneus longus to the dorsum of the foot in line with the subtalar axis it would correct your first metatarsal drop your dorsiflexors would get strengthened and your inverters and everters would get balanced so a simple illustration but it can help you to plan your deformity correction another example they have given of the cpn palsy and in cpn palsy a tbl is posterior transfer would effectively you know correct your uh, help to correct your uh, muscle imbalance 
so to conclude paralytic deformities uh, disorders the deformities should be corrected by muscle rebalancing plus deformity correction plus joint stabilization not addressing any of the above will lead to recurrence post operative maintenance of correction with bracing is vital thank you uh, i invite the next speaker uh, hitesh sir to deliver his talk on pes cables i think the sandeep has included many things so make my job easier but i'll emphasize few points the more it's just last session we discussed lot on the flat foot and we are discussing on a cavus foot the important point on the flat foot it can happen in the postural as well as ligamentous laxity or the child would be chubby we can't see about the medial longitudinal arch where the cavus happens most of the time it's a neuromuscular so always if you see about a child with unilateral or a bilateral cavus think about the neuromuscular causes so in short if we say the sandeep's lecture and my this one so it is almost similar to that it's cavus it's happened to the secondary to the neuromuscular causes the basic principles remain the same so what sandeep said is a almost same so i'm going to discuss a few points on the cavus what is a cavus etiology clinical assessment investigation and management as said the medial longitudinal arch is exaggerated it's a cavus so whenever it is going more than the normal where it is very commonly it will be associated with the clawing also if it is the, because of the charcot marie's or there are the many causes for the cavus but it's because the metatarsal phalangeal joint is in dorsiflex and it automatically leads to the the flexion of the ip and dip the pip and dip that is also very common so it is very common to have a description of both whenever we'll see about the cavus we need to examine about the hind foot mid foot fore foot as well as the great toe and lesser toe deformities so what are the types of the cavus as i said very very commonly it is in neuromuscular but sometimes it will be associated in case of the club foot we describe the cavus but it's a pronated feet so it will be also it a part of the congenital it's isolated or it will be associated with other deformity but in case of the congenital it may not progress if it is neuromuscular it will progress so it's like a this is the cavus deformity in a congenital dolipus equinovarus which we discuss in morning its first session very commonly we will see the neurological cases neuromuscular cases then due to the muscle imbalance and because of the muscle imbalance is not getting corrected it tends to progress and often it become the symptomatic so what are the reason that we will get the kovarus or cavus the charcot marie tooth disease spina bifida spinal dysmorphism as he already mentioned polio pedicatrixia and cerebral palsy very very commonly if you see about the case of the cavus always 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 check the spine because many times child may not be the spastic many time may not be polio very common have two important cause spinal dysmorphism and charcot marie tooth disease these are the two important cause for the face cavus it's a, whether it is asymmetrical it is a spine symmetrical common to have a charcot marie tooth disease what are the reason in that what happen in case of the cavus as we said medial longitudinal charge is exaggerated and it may may not be associated with hind foot deformity what are the deformity of the hind foot at the ankle it may be having cavus will be associated with equinus that is equino cavus and it may associated with the calcaneus that is calcaneo cavus it may be associated with subtalar whether subtalar varus or valgus very common in charcot marie tooth it is common have the pes cavus with the varus that's called as keo varus or it may be associated with the clawing it may be having in clawing how does it happen in cavus in neuromuscular cases as he mentioned that in uh, very rightly that because if the ankle dorsiflexion is weak that can lead to the equino cavus because there is no dorsiflexion pull there is a plantar flexion pull that can lead to the equino cavus like that this is a child when there is a plantar flexion weakness when there is a inability to have tendo achilles weakness it can lead to the calcano cavus it's a, because there is a no pull of the plantar flexion it can lead to calcano cavus like that this is the case in calcano cavus when there is a subtalar joint involved there is a ureter weakness that can lead to the keo varus because ureter are not functioning 
then this is, is like this case secondary to spinal dystrophism there is a inverter weakness that can lead to the ko valgus like that it is very commonly seen in the like people will get full of because of this a flat foot is flat foot will hind foot will valgus but it will be associated with cavus also and there is an intrinsic paralysis where there is a because of the intrinsic muscle of the foot it can lead to the clawing of the toes like that you can see about that the first ray is drop and associated with the intrinsic muscle paralysis there is a greater draw associated with the lesser draw complex deformity also common with more than one joint involved like equino ko rs how to assess the child with the cavus always check whether it is a cosmetic deformity or a symptomatic deformity associated with the pain callosity cons or footwear problem and if it is a neuromuscular it tends to progress so always check whether it is in subtalar ankle metatarsal as well as this child is, has got the unilateral ko varus with a lesser to problem that gives idea about the spinal dysrhythm like always exam in the spine you say the top top fair present on the back side so it will very very common and as sandeep mentioned uh, always always examine the sensory problem because if it is associated with sensory problem it can lead to the trophic ulceration depends on the deformity if it is a calcaneus deformity it will have the heel if it is a plantar flexion problem it will have at the toe so because the presser point is on front the trophic ulcer happen on front if presser pro- uh, point is on back it will have calcaneus problem so we'll see about the clinical assessment see about component of deformity determine whether it is supple or rigid whether it is flexible or correctable or not correctable whether which compensatory are the compensatory which are the compensatory very commonly described in a tripod of the foot the cavus can lead to the secondary pronation of the forefoot and because of the secondary pronation of forefoot there is a varus deformity of hind foot happen <coughs> this is the example tibial is anterior weakness in a drop of the first metatarsal so that is called as the pronation of forefoot and because it is a pronated forefoot is in pronated in order to bring the foot into the position into to touch the ground the hind foot will go into the varus so that is li- lead to the cavo varus and that is the basis for the colman block test we put that into the patient on the first ray is off the ground and if cavus gets corrected that means the hind foot varus is flexible or not that means a colman block test in other sense if you see about the child with the cavo varus varus of the hind foot we put off the ground first ray is off the ground and then we'll say varus is getting corrected hind foot varus if it is there it's a valgus or not that will decide whether to do about correction or not this is a pictorial aspect of the hind foot varus that's if we put us off the ground the first ray is off the ground then uh, the hind foot is getting corrected or not this is the colman twist varus and that cause the varus is rigid it's not getting corrected so this is the basic for the all the uh, varus correction in ko varus always check about the detail examination of the muscle charting as sandeep mentioned always say about the front dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the ankle inverter and inverter of the subtalar so it's always always check the manual muscle testing of that and he rightly pointed out this is the the concept from the dr benjamin joseph and he divide into the subtalar into the medial aspect lateral aspect and ankle on the front aspect and back aspect and we'll say whether it is imbalance is present on which aspects whether you can grade 0 to 5 when there is a, the empty hole or empty round it is zero then it's completely dark it will be filed so we can make out whether it is muscle imbalance is there by this laboratory investigation either it will depends on the cause whether you suspect about the spinal dysrhythm and require the spine x-ray and mri is required now conduction study and cause to find out the reason whether it's a reversible or irreversible clinical assessment on radiological we can do about the calcaneum pitch is also described mary's angle it's have been actually zero but it will be more in case of the talus and first metatarsal angle would be there this is a normal foot but it will be zero when calcaneum first metatarsal angle also in case of the cavus it is more so that is the three important aspects we can say about the severity pedoverography if it is there whether the static or a dynamic whether the cavus is which part of the forefoot and hindfoot is 
contact which is come in contact with the foot it is required coming to the point for the treatment what well, is very little role of the conservative treatment because it is tends to progress but in case of the early deformity when the child is young we don't know about the cause we can do about the molded insole and custom sweat and monitor the progression of the disorder but when it's required to do about the surgical treatment when the child becomes symptomatic and when the orthosis is ineffective and before it will become the stiff if you don't do the early intervention the cavus the flexible varus would be there but if flexible varus is not getting control then ultimately it will lead to the stiff the hind foot can lead to the varus so the surgical dose would be more if you do intervene late so that's why decision making it's important to know about the age whether it's adolescent or adult or the very young child underlying disease location and muscle imbalance same is that to get a pain free plantigrade subtalar foot and the method may be soft tissue release osteotomy and tendon transfer correct the deformity and restore the muscle imbalance in short that is the principal treatment and mainstay is a tendon transfer we'll see about the high arch which you do the plantar fascia release and then do about the muscle transfer tendon transfer as according to the imbalance so very commonly it's a cavus is present which isolated with uh, plantar fascia tight you do about the plantar fascia release and do about the stainless procedure if there is a moderate cavus with uh, at the apex with the metatarsal you do about the metatarsal osteotomy along with the stainless release you do about the metatarsal osteotomy in that primary pathology is the tibial is anterior weakness you do about the basal extension osteotomy along with the tendon transfer do the extension osteotomy the primary pathology is a calcaneus you do about simensen or the calcaneal osteotomy watch also sandeep has already mentioned if it is there if the varus deformity is fixed you do about lateral displacement osteotomy of the hind foot that's been seen as that in a complex deformity in adolescent it's require about a triple fusion so it is always essential the anatomy can be restored by either soft tissue or osteotomy but it must be maintained by muscle rebalancing procedure so like uh, as he mentioned about that paralysis there in the case of the tricep sure if you see there is a front part is working the lateral uh, half is also working medial half is also not working so what you need to do about that from the two lateral half one can be transferred that is no tendon can replace about the tendo achilles weakness but that is called as a peroneal translocation or you can do about tendon transfer this is the picture this is very important for the understanding i am not going in detail about each and every procedure but depends on the site of deformity or the type of deformity it will require about the soft tissue or the bony procedure plus minus the muscle rebalancing procedure summary we need to find out whether it's a idiopathic or acquired acquired is common in the muscular causes management always look for the causes see about whether rigid or supple always 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 correct the muscle imbalance in case of the neuromuscular very limited role for the conservative treatment always get about the soft tissue plus minus osteotomy plus muscle rebalancing procedure thank you thank you dr hitesh any questions in this session i think everybody is feeling tired we'll go for video session we are going for video session now so this is going to be a just quick revision of the theory part already we have seen before half an hour but i am going to repeat that uh, we already saw that the procedure for diplegic children is a striers procedure and because it's an easy procedure you can definitely carry out 
uh, first of all, we will understand the concept and then we will see the surgical technique. So the point, important point is like, we need to go between the gastro and the soleus. So we can go from the posterior side or we can go from medial side. I will show you both the videos so that it becomes easy for you. And then we cut the gastro part and we separate it from the insertion. That's all. So that's a simple procedure. And uh, let's see the video. The first video is by Thomas Novacek, a very popular or a very prominent uh, cerebral palsy surgeon. So he is going to demonstrate which video player should I use? VLC. Okay. This procedure is performed with the patient prone. The muscular tendinous junction of the gastrocnemius muscle belly and the tendon is palpated to localize the posterior midline incision. The subcutaneous layer is bluntly dissected to protect the superficial veins and nerves. The sural nerve is identified just beneath the deep fascia in the midline since it emerges proximally between the two heads of the gastrocnemius. The nerve is mobilized. The interval between the gastrocnemius and the soleus can typically be found fairly easily by passing your finger along the medial side of the gastrocnemius muscle belly proximally. Here is the muscular tendinous junction of the gastrocnemius muscle belly and the tendon. Here is the sural nerve. This is the interval between the gastrocnemius and the soleus underneath. At this point, you will need to develop this interval distally to get to the tendinous portion of the gastrocnemius. Use an instrument underneath the gastrocnemius to develop that interval. Once again, note that the soleus fascia is intact. Note that the distal end of the medial head of the gastrocnemius is more distal. The tendon of the gastrocnemius is divided with electrocautery or with the scalpel. With the gastrocnemius completely released, you can see the soleus fascia intact underneath. The knee is placed in an extended position with the ankle dorsiflexed between neutral and five degrees of dorsiflexion. Then the gastrocnemius is repaired to the underlying soleus fascia using two or three interrupted sutures. Typical second rocker position is 10 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion with the knee in full extension. The wound is closed in the typical fashion. Any question? Clear. Right, so soleus fascia was very clearly seen and only the superficial portion was cut. Now the same procedure can be done by a medial approach, keeping the patient in supine position. This was in a prone position. So if you want to combine hamstring and this procedure, prone position is better, but sometimes anesthetists are not very comfortable with prone position. So in that case, we can go for uh, this thing. This is by uh, my friend Jain Sampath from Bangalore.
Navi is approaching from the medial side. This is a, a medial border of the tibia, around two finger width uh, behind that. The advantage sural nerve is not in the plane of dissection. That's the main advantage. So this is the plane between the two. Now this is the insertion, so we need to go slightly proximally so that we can find the plane easily between two muscles. Finger is the best way to dissect the plane. Any question? I think, yes, you are very uh, sharp in observation that uh, he is not completely detached. So that's why the classical striers is the one which was described in the previous video, where the complete gastro proximal, uh, proximal part is separate from the insertion. Yes, you are very right. This is more like a vulpius, but the reason why I showed this is like uh, the medial approach. That is why I, I showed this. You are very right that this is more like a vulpius rather than striers. But the medial approach is very important. Very small number in diaplegic patient. Yes, in hemiplegic, uh, if you go for this procedure, then you need to cut soleus but uh, very rarely in diaplegic. Yes, please. Now both, both, both. The point which he said is like the medial head as an insertion or the muscular belly right distally, while the belly on the lateral side is slightly higher. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, please. It becomes a totally fl uh, flat foot and a uh, dysfunctional foot. So uh, you have left this topic in your uh, flexible fl flat foot. Then I will make want your comment on this topic. Sir. Okay. Sir, uh, what you are talking is about the adult acquired adult, yeah. Uh, yeah. tibialis posterior dysfunction. Yes, sir. Yeah, TTPD or something is the name or adult acquired uh, flat foot, which is very different than this one. To begin with, they are normal. Their arch is normal. After the age of 40, 45, they develop a uh, flat foot. And the treatment is very different than what we uh, discussed because initially the focus should be on tibialis posterior. And when there is a joint deformity, we need to resort to the same procedure, uh, literal column lengthening or the uh, 3C procedure, which uh, Sandeep described. So you don't see that in the pediatric age group so much. It's more in, not, not, not adolescent. adolescent. That's in adult it's or in geriatric older, population. Older patients, really, geriatric population. The tibialis posterior gets stretched out yeah. and eventually even ruptures sometimes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll should we close the session? Okay. We'll fe felicitate our chairpersons. Uh, the faculties which we will be felicitated to tomorrow. So may I call Dr. Subhash Chandra sir and 
Uh, Dr. Sandeep Vedya, sir, please do the honors. Dr. Subhash, sir. Thank you, sir. And Dr. Janki, please. So, tomorrow's starting. Yeah, before time. we break, so we are towards the end of today's sessions. Tomorrow, the breakfast is at 8 a.m. And uh, we'll be starting sharp at 8.30, the rest of the sessions. Trauma session is the first, 8.30 a.m. So please bear, be here on time at 8 a.m. and uh, have your breakfast. Uh, next, we have the dinner now. It's ready outside. And uh, the faculties will be meeting now. Thank you for all the hard listenings and patience listening. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was...